morning. Will the Committee on Zoning and Planning please come to order? Those wishing to testify this morning, if you have not, please submit your registration form to our committee aide, seated to my right. Otherwise, you may raise your hand indicating a desire to speak at the time I call for additional testifiers. Speakers will be limited to a one-minute presentation on all items before the committee this morning. Written testimonies, including testifiers' address, email address, and phone number may be posted by the city clerk and available to the public on the city's DocuShare website. As a courtesy, please turn off all cell phones, pagers, and other electronic devices throughout this morning's proceedings. The chair would like to thank committee vice chair Harimoto and council members Kobayashi and Pine for helping us fulfill quorum this morning. Members, are there any objections to approving the minutes of the June 26th meeting of the Committee on Zoning and Planning as circulated? If there are no objections, the minutes are approved. Members, agenda item number one this morning is resolution 14-71, approving the IAO Pro City Neighborhood Transit Oriented Development Plan. Would the administration please come forward? Prior to the administration's remarks, uh, the chair would like to recognize for opening statement on the IAO Pro City Neighborhood Transit Oriented Development Plan, the council member of the district, Vice Chair Harimura. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this plan has been years in the making. We've had numerous community uh, meetings uh, to talk about this. Uh, this is the second plan that we are approving, and um, you know the first two plans by Pahu and IAEA Pro City, we wanted to take very slow and see, you know, make sure we address all the concerns, make sure that we've uh, readdressed uh, issues as the years passed. And I think we're at the point now where um, we know what we're doing, the community has bought into it, and as far as I know, there are no concerns. So I just wanted to lay the groundwork that we are ready to move expeditiously, uh, not only with this plan, but all plans to follow. And I hope that, um, DPP will be ready to um, package the rest of the plans to move forward, and we are certainly uh, willing to expedite. Uh, but beyond that, I just wanted to again thank the Department um, of Planning and Permitting for the years of efforts working with our community on these plans, um, specifically to thank Bonnie Arakawa and Kathy Sokugawa for their expertise and um, many years working with us. It seems like uh, we're finally moving ahead. So thank you very much for all your patience and expertise. Thank you, Vice Chair. For the administration. Thank you, thank you Chair Harrison Roof, Community Building and TUD Administrator, with Bunny Arakawa, the Project Manager for the plan. Um, we're going to spare you the, the PowerPoint on this one and just uh, walk through quickly the, the plan summary highlights. You do have a copy of the entire plan, but uh, a highlight, and I should uh, uh, mentioned from members of the public, there are a few of those over there if anybody wants to take one. Um, as as Councilmember Haramoto noted, we've gone through an extended process similar to what we did in Waipahu, two large public meetings in 2009, two more large public meetings in 2010, and then we had a fifth uh, public meeting uh, earlier this year sponsored by Councilmember Haramoto. We've also been to the neighborhood boards as well as a joint uh, legislator and council member workshop in uh, uh, in Pearl Ridge. Uh, looking at the principles that were adopted, they, they've been strongly endorsed. Uh, there's been no changes <coughs> suggested to the principles, creating access and views to water and Pearl Harbor historic trail, um, encouraging workforce housing. Uh, as you are aware, and thank you very much for your, for your vote in, in the budget to uh, allocate funding to purchase uh, land near the trail, near the transit station. We're combining principles one and two in a project to develop housing above a bus transfer center and uh, uh, you know, near the bus transfer station. So we're actually acting on those principles right now. Creating a comfortable and lively pedestrian environment. Uh, I, should, uh, I should note that the uh, Robinson uh, property folks and Live Work Play I, uh, uh, have agreed in their development agreement to not only improve the environment around their uh, cam drive in site, but also extend those improvements down uh, Kaunohe Street, and we've already met with them to look at their pre preliminary plans on those improvements on Kaunohe. 
Uh, principle number four, providing multimodal access to and from the stations. Again, the proposed bus transfer station is also going to really help with a place to turn around the local buses that will lead to the rail station. And then developing new and enhancing existing open space amenities. And we're, we're also working on that one in particular for a transit plaza on the Mackay side of the, that Pearl Ridge uh, station property. Uh, looking at the just a couple highlights on page uh, six and seven of what's actually in the plan, um, LCC stations, you know, a college-oriented neighborhood with infill housing, educational retail development plan for the existing parking lot. That'll be up to the up to the state, but as once the rail is in, we expect that that some of that to, to develop uh, over time. Uh, some additional vehicular access, uh, potential connections to the trail, the campus quad gathering space. At the Pearl Highlands Station, there are infill development opportunities around the station. Uh, MW Group is actually building a, a, a senior center, just uh, a, a senior housing, uh, just Malka of the Pearl Highlands Station, so we're already seeing some action on that. Uh, better vehicular access, I think, as, as you're aware, there'll be an off-ramp from H2 right into the parking garage there at Pearl Highlands. Uh, and uh, the pedestrian bridge to station is still in the plan, but it is not currently in Hart's plan. It, at the Pearl Ridge Station, uh, that's really uh, looking at the potential for uh, really capitalizing on the Pearl Harbor Historic Trail with eventual development of lots of the Mackay properties along the trail. We would actually call that trail-oriented development, like they're proving really successful in the Atlanta Beltline right now. Um, our catalytic project that you guys agreed to fund the initial planning for and the land acquisition, we hope will prove to the market that that makes sense. Um, I think uh, we'll, we'll kind of cut that part short. You guys, I think, are fairly familiar with the plan. Uh, we can take any comments on the plan, but I just also want to highlight that when we met with folks in, uh, in 2014, the most recent workshops, we had about a, a five-page list of comments that we, uh, and edits that we made to the plan based on public input. And so we, we aired those with folks in, at the recent meetings. and. Uh, we got general agreement from everybody at the workshops that the edits we had made reflected their comments, and, and folks seemed pretty satisfied. Council Member Haramoto, you were at all the meetings. I think we uh, we have satisfied the community's uh, desire to make sure that we've captured their vision in the plan, and they are asking us, as well as they're asking you, how do we move forward and implement it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any questions for the administration? Thank you. We have two registered testifiers on Resolution 14-71, Cindy McMillan, followed by Arvid Youngquist. Good morning, Chair Anderson and members of the committee. Cindy McMillan representing the Pacific Resource Partnership. You have our written testimony supporting this resolution, and I'd just like to emphasize why we support it. We support this plan because it offers a new community access, access to new homes, access to jobs, access to thriving business community with plenty of amenities for people to walk to. Uh, we also support this plan because it offers new opportunities for increased park space, open space, and places for people to gather. We believe that this type of new community offers all of us better access to these things. We support it and ask your favorable consideration. Mahalo. Thank you. Members, any questions for Ms. McMillan? Thank you very much. Arvid Youngquist. Good morning. Morning, Chair. Members of the committee. Good to see you this morning. How are you? My name is Arvid Youngquist. I also offer testimony in general support for Resolution 14-71. I do support the concept of Todd. I've been an early supporter of the fixed rail. However, that fixed rail has been in the works for several administrations now. We have been, as a community, accused of being a banana republic in terms of getting things done, permit, and so forth. When you say the community has no concerns, uh, I would like to have the administration assure us, including Hart, 
that they actually went to the neighborhood board themselves, not through uh, the area uh, council member or the incoming state senator. And when I say assurance, I mean were any concerns expressed that were incorporated in the final plan? Thank you. Members, any questions? Thank you. Is there anyone else here with us this morning who'd like to testify on resolution 14-71 who has not? Okay, if not, uh, Director Otto, could we bring you forward, please? Well, yeah, the, uh, as uh, Harrison mentioned, and uh, yeah, we don't, we, as far as uh, Mr. Youngquist's uh, comments, yes, uh, the department did, uh, all our staff members went, went to pretty much all of the meetings, and uh, as I think we incorporated as much of the uh, comments and concerns that we were aware of. So, uh, yeah, we, I, I would say I think we've accommodated that. Thank you, Director. Mm -hmm. uh, Director, the council adopted resolution 13-274 last December 11th regarding the transit-oriented development affordable housing policy. Yeah. Can you give us a status on that affordable housing policy that the administration is working on? Okay. At that time, I mentioned that we were also working on a comprehensive uh, island-wide housing Correct. policy, and uh, we have done so, and we, we're almost ready to, uh, you know, uh, we, I'd say we're at a pre-final draft level, so within the next couple of weeks we will be able to come out with uh, that comprehensive policy. The TOD housing policy is uh, incorporated as part of that policy, and so it's, uh, uh, you know, you know I, I, I forget how many weeks, but it'll be out shortly, and so. So the administration is planning to <laughs> unveil a the comprehensive Compre affordable housing policy? Yes. of which the TOD affordable housing policy will be part of it. Yes. Okay. Additionally, uh, regarding the proposed community benefits package, uh, how is that going to be implemented? And is your department going to uh, determine whether or not uh, that it's been implemented and how it will be implemented? Well, the community benefits package is uh, as... Uh, I guess it, it, and the plan itself is actually sets a framework. So the benefits would be a combination of uh, private developments and uh, what what would come with agreements or, or uh, you know development permits that come. So the live work play IA is one example. Mm -hmm. So there is no comprehensive um, uh, you know community benefits, but those be benefits will be negotiated as individual developers come in. On top of that, the city, uh, by treating the uh, Pearl Ridge Station as a catalytic project, is, will be bringing some of its own resources, and that's why I think the uh, purchase of the, that uh, property adjacent to the station, where the bus terminal will occur, we are looking at developing housing, and uh, uh, so so there'll be both uh, public uh, efforts and uh, negotiations with private entities. So this it'll be a combination of. Uh, of you know different kinds of actions that will result in public uh, community benefits for the areas. Will your department ensure that there's a fair trade-off between the development bonuses given by the city and the community benefits that the project will provide? Uh, we, uh, we, uh, uh, yes, I can say that we're actually trying to wor uh, work out a formula so that you know uh, you know bonuses on heights and densities that are given will be tied to you know open space. Uh, 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 transit connectivity, affordable housing. So we're trying to work out what is an actual fair uh, proportion of benefits for for the uh, increased heights and densities. So that's something that we're still we haven't finalized the uh, the, the formula yet, but we're trying to work on it. So that uh, I think that uh, at the end of the day, we feel that there's an act you know an adequate uh, trade-off between uh, higher densities and bonuses and you know, the, the various types of community benefits. So I, I, I can't give you a specific, and you know, for 10 feet of height, how much community benefits or yet, because we're still working that. But you um, have assured the committee that your department will ensure that there is a fair trade-off. Uh, yeah, we, we will work out a fair, a fair trade. Okay. Members, any questions for Director Otto? Thank you, Director. Okay, 
is there no one else who would like to testify on resolution 14-71 members the chair recommends that resolution 14-71 be reported out of committee for scheduling of a public hearing and then be referred uh, back to committee any discussion vice chair harimoto thank you mr chair in strong support of your recommendation um, as i said earlier this plan has been years in the making and it truly is a collaborative effort um, between the city and the community. Um, it really is an exciting vision. It truly is. Uh, we are just um, really happy with the end product. Um, you know, rail coming directly through all of our communities um, presents a real opportunity for us. Um, and this plan really is a culmination of all of that opportunity. Um, but I just wanted to make clear that there's no expectation that this will be implemented overnight. Um, this plan is a great plan, but it'll take years for the implementation to occur. But I'm really excited that the city is kind of spurring that, that future implementation by the um, uh, opportunities with the rail line and the park and transit center. I think this will really jumpstart it. Um, but, you know, I've lived in my community for my entire life, and I've seen change, some Maybe not so good, some good. Um, but I think this represents truly good change, outstanding vision. So I really hope that uh, my colleagues who can support this. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Members, any further discussion? If not, any objections to reporting Resolution 14-71 out of committee for scheduling of a public hearing and be referred back to the committee? No objections. Any reservations? Hearing none so ordered. Resolution 14-71 has been reported out. Uh, the Chair would also like to rec uh, recognize the presence of Council Member Ron Menor. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Next item on our agenda is Resolution 14-165, granting a special management area use permit and shoreline setback variance to construct the High priority elements of the Coconut Island Infrastructure Rehabilitation and Replacement Project. Members, we have a proposed hand-carried CD1 that is in your packet. The CD1 changes the title of the resolution to state that the resolution grants a special management area use permit and shoreline setback variance and makes other technical and non-substantive amendments as well. Would the applicant and the representatives of the applicant please come forward? Good morning, Chair, members of the committee. Good morning. My name is Derek Mukai. I'm with uh, Community Planning and Engineering. I'm the project manager on this project. Here with us today, we have Hernan Ko and uh, Mia Akiba with uh, Community Planning. We also have Jim Lakey with HIMB and Dr. Joanne Leong, who's the director of uh, Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Thank you for the opportunity to present to uh, this project to you this morning. Uh, we have a quick PowerPoint presentation. Um, I guess, uh, as some of you may know, Coconut Island serves as a world-class marine research center for the University of Hawaii. The island facility has been around for many years and time has taken its toll on its infrastructure. New facilities have recently been added to the island and more important more improvements are being proposed in the future, so it's critical that the infrastructure be upgraded as well. Uh, the scope of work, as you can see, requires uh, utility rehabilitation and replacement. Uh, the colors are to kind of show where the alignments are for all the utilities. Basically, we're replacing the sewer force main, uh, the water line, the electric line, HECO, and Hawaiian Tell's uh, communication line. We also will be rerouting uh, an existing gravity sewer line on the north end of the island and replacing the sewer pumps and rehab, rehabilitating the, the existing wet well. Next slide. I guess we have some of the photos uh, which show some of the existing utilities. On the top photo, we have the, the existing water line and the sewer force main, which is mounted to the underside of the pier. On the bottom, I think if you look really closely, you can see some of the trench marks left from the old utilities. Next. Uh, this is the north end side of the lagoon. It's, it's kind of like a, 
uh, s public swimming area. But you can see where the bridges are where we have a couple utilities. Uh, those are actually uh, sewer mains. So what we want to do is abandon this section of the island because it's no longer being used and put in a, a shorter route from the existing dorm on the upper right hand corner to the pump station. Here we have photos of the existing pump station. It's uh, over 30 years old, so it's in dire need of replacing. Next. Uh, this is taken from our construction drawing. It shows the alignment of the new utilities that we're adding. Uh, there are three bores. The one on the bottom is the, an, a six inch or eight inch water line. The one above it is uh, the electrical conduit. And uh, the one up on the top is a shared conduit with which will have the existing, uh, will have the new sewer force main with uh, the telecommunication line. Uh, this is just a graphic to show the process which we're going to install the, the new utilities. It's called horizontal directional drilling. And it's basically a surface to surface uh, installation method. Uh, the utility will be approximately 40 feet under the bottom of the bay. Uh, and this is a site where uh, we're going to be launching the utilities or the drill entry site. It's uh, the parking area for HIMB faculty and students. Uh, this graphic shows the existing, well, the routing of the new gravity uh, sewer line in yellow. And this graphic shows uh, what the new pump station is going to look like. It's almost identical to the existing pump station. So basically all we're doing is replacing old pumps with new pumps. So uh, we're not really demolishing the, the whole structure. We're just taking the, the pumps out and putting new ones in. And uh, that's about it. That's our presentation. Any questions, comments? Members, any questions for the applicant? Thank you very much. Thank you. Would the administration please come forward? George Arthur, Director of uh, Planning and Permitting, and with me is Steve Tagawa, the planner who worked on the application. Yeah, the administration is in support of this uh, resolution. And we're very familiar with the improvements on Coconut Island, and most of the basically, uh, to, as you can see, a replacement of old lines and to, uh, essentially uh, making re uh, improvements to prevent any potential spills or any other thing that might occur with old lines. So it's a you know, it's a proactive uh, uh, effort to make sure that all of the operations at Coconut Island continue to go smoothly. Okay. Members, any questions for the administration? Thank you very much, Director. Hey, members, the Chair recommends that Resolution 14-165 be amended to the hand carriage CD1 outlined earlier. Um, prior to the amendment, uh, there, we don't have any registered testifiers. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this item? Mr. Youngquist, please come forward. Good morning again, Chair morning, Anderson, course. members of your committee. Thank you for permitting me to speak yet again on something. This time I was not scheduled to speak. In principle, of course, I support this. That particular location, I think, was often used for the old uh, Hawaii Five O, and it's a place where uh, Dr. Anderson worked, or still does. The topic of sewage spills He's been in the uh, news lately in Palolo. Somebody stuffed some closing in a manhole. So if this improvement to the sewage system is anti-gravity, if that's the correct term, instead of brown water uh, spills, perhaps they can dispose of the sewage in the wrong direction and help out the area. So in that respect, I support this project. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Members. Any questions for Mr. Youngquist? Okay, is there anyone else who would like to testify on resolution 14-165? Okay. If not, uh, the chair recommend that resolution 14-165 be amended to the hand carried CD1 as outlined earlier. Any discussions? Any discussion on the, the chair's recommendation to amend? If not, any reservations, objections? Hearing none, the resolution has been amended to a CD1. The chair further recommends that resolution 14-165 CD1 be reported out for adoption. Any discussion? Any reservations or objections? Hearing none, so ordered. Resolution 14-165 CD1 has been reported out for adoption. Members, we're just going to take a short recess before we uh, move on to the next items on our agenda. Short recess. Zoning and Planning, please return to order. Members, we'll be taking up agenda items three and four together. Both bills prohibit persons from sitting or lying on public sidewalks subject 
uh, to certain exceptions. Uh, Bill 42 of 2014 and Bill 45 of 2014 as well. Uh, members, when we go into the next agenda items, uh, number three and four, I'm sorry, members, when we go into agenda items, five and six afterwards, uh, these items uh, pertain to urinating and defecating in public. Uh, members, we were, before we do decision making on any of these items, I would like to allow for public testimony because some members have requested that we go into executive session to consult with our attorneys from Corporation Council. So I would like to offer the public the opportunity to testify on all of the bills before we go into executive session so folks are not uh, sitting here waiting for us to come back out of executive session before they get a chance to testify. Okay, so we are going to take uh, testimony on agenda items uh, three and four as well as uh, five and six right afterward. And uh, members of the public, you will have the opportunity to testify on all of these measures today before the council, before we go into executive session. Okay, members, agenda items uh, three and four. Bill 42, prohibiting subject to exceptions persons from sitting or lying on public sidewalks in the Waikiki Special District. Members, we have a proposed posted CD1 from council member Harimoto. For your information, the changes are listed on the agenda. Council member Harimoto's proposed amendments change the effective date of the ordinance from date of approval to January 1st, 2015. And council member Harimoto has also proposed other miscellaneous technical and non-substantive changes. Bill 45 prohibits persons from sitting or lying on public sidewalks subject to exceptions. Our members, we have two proposed posted CD1 versions. For your information, the changes are listed on the agenda. Uh, the first uh, proposal is from my office. New language appears on page 2, section 29-1, to prohibit sitting or lying on public sidewalks during the hours of 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. rather than a 24-hour prohibition. New language appears at page 3, section 29-1B9, to provide an exception from the prohibition in Bill 45 for sitting or lying in a designated geographic area regulated by separate ordinance enactment. And there are also miscellaneous technical and non-substantive amendments. There's also a CD1 offered by Council Member Carol Fukunaga. Uh, Council Member Fukunaga's amendments extend the prohibition against sitting or lying down to public malls as defined in revised ordinances of Honolulu, section 29-1.1. And Council Member Fukunaga also makes miscellaneous technical and non-substantive amendments. Members, the Chair is aware that these items uh, have been rather difficult to discuss and bring forward, and I'd like to thank the committee for your continued leadership and assistance on these issues. As you know, members, this committee, uh, this council made the very difficult uh, decision, albeit I feel step in the right direction, uh, when we passed an ordinance last year uh, that allowed the city to be able to remove obstructions from our city sidewalks. As we can see here on the poster board to my left, if you take a look at this poster board here, we can see the situation at Thomas Square prior to the ordinance that was enacted last year as a result of Bill 7 of 2013. You see a lot of debris on the sidewalks. You see street parking being obstructed. You see folks who are trying to move mobility devices out of their cars, having difficulty doing that because of some of the debris blocking the sidewalks there. Now, if you look at the poster board uh, to, the, to the right, you'll see what Thomas Square looks like today. You'll see sidewalks that are a lot more passable. You'll see sidewalks that are open and clear for all members of the public. The reason the council passed this ordinance last year was in our effort, and I believe our responsibility, 
to the people of the city and county of Honolulu who expect and deserve that all of our citizens have equal access to all of our public spaces. Some folks members will question the intent of moving these bills forward and some will question the intent uh, the some will also question the compassion of the Honolulu City Council in moving these measures forward. This council has taken the unprecedented step of appropriating more than $45 million to help to com combat affordable housing, homelessness, and housing first in our community. We will hear from the administration today on their efforts to implement a solid housing first initiative in the city and county of Honolulu. It is uh, my goal, members, it is uh, to work with Mayor Kirk Caldwell and his administration in moving forward with a solid housing first initiative. You'll also see, members, a poster board here in the middle that takes various headlines from media articles published in Honolulu Media over the last 18 months that talk about violent acts that have been committed on members of our unsheltered community. Would it be best, members, to leave our unsheltered out on the sidewalks subject to this type of violence? Or would it be best to move items like this forward to encourage folks to move on, to seek shelter, to seek the available beds that are currently offered and available in our shelters as of right now, and the shelters that will become available in our working with Mayor Caldwell and his administration. Ultimately, members, that's a question that all of us sitting here today are going to have to decide as to whether or not we are going to advance these measures forward or whether we're going to hold them in committee. I do look forward to hearing uh, public testimony this morning. I also look forward to hearing from the Caldwell administration on their efforts to partner with the City Council and with the community in moving forward with their plan for housing first as well as for shelter opportunities for working homeless and for homeless families. Would the director of the city office of housing please come forward? Uh, Chair? Yes, I... Councilmember Member Menor. Yeah, I, just for clarification, uh, perhaps you, you uh, inadvertently omitted uh, this, but um, to get a full discussion, so we're going to be hearing all bills, including Bill 48, uh, together. Um, as you know, I, I have a hand-carried uh, CD1 to Bill 48, which would uh, prohibit sitting and lying on public sidewalk in designated areas. It's a hand-carried uh, CD1 that I uh, distributed to all of the committee members yesterday. And uh, you also have copies uh, of that proposed CD1 uh, before you uh, at this time. Uh, if we're going to have a full discussion regarding all of these measures, um, I wanted to have the opportunity to at least briefly explain the proposed CD1 because uh, there are members in, of the general public, of course, who have not had an opportunity to, to go through the provisions. And uh, I think it would be helpful if the uh, community could also provide input, testifiers could also provide input regarding the uh, hand-carried CD1. So with your indulgence, may I go through the uh, offer brief remarks on, on the proposed CD1? Please proceed, Council Member Menor. Okay, I, I really appreciate that. Um, so anyway, the per I, we do have a hand-carried proposed CD1 uh, with respect to uh, Bill 48. Uh, the purpose of the, men of the amendments contained in the proposed CD1 is to more specifically delineate the commercial and business areas that would be covered under this bill. These amendments were drafted in close consultation with the Office of the Corporation Council to ensure that they fall within the parameters and are consistent with the decisions of the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which has reviewed similar sidewalk ordinances on the mainland and other jurisdictions. In this regard, the proposed CD1 includes geographic boundary restrictions that are similar to those contained in Seattle's sidewalk ordinance, which was upheld by the Ninth Circuit Court, which is the Federal Circuit for Hawaii. The Corporation Council believes that the proposed CD1 can withstand a constitutional challenge. The proposed CD1 establishes six zones or areas on Oahu where the prohibition under this bill would apply. These six, these six areas are areas that are zoned commercial or business in the B1, B2, BMX3, or BMX4 districts under the Land Use Ordinance, or LUO. 
The commercial or business zones that are designated under the bill include bounded areas whose boundaries are defined by specific streets that are listed in the CD1. The Chinatown zone is an example of this. The designated commercial or business zones would also include street segments where the prohibition would apply to the public sidewalks abutting the street segment. The Kalihi Zone A is an example of this. The six zones in the proposed CD1 include Chinatown, Downtown, Makali Mo'ili'ili, Waipahu, Kalihi, and Kailua. These areas were selected based on concerns that have been expressed by residents and businesses about activities that have impeded or obstructed the use of public sidewalks in commercial and business areas. As you know, the districts represented by Council Members Fukunaga and Kobayashi have been especially impacted by these concerns. Now, as you go through the CD1, you will find that it includes as exhibits zone maps that clearly delineate the boundaries of the various zones. These maps are illustrative of the areas that would be covered under the bill and if enacted into law would be part of the revised ordinances of Honolulu. Honolulu. And I'd like to note that uh, color scans for the map boundaries are attached to the bill. These maps should help to provide clear notice to law enforcement and the general public as to which areas are covered. Using common neighborhood names and familiar street names will also help in this regard. I would like to clarify that the CD1 does not include the business and commercial districts in Waikiki because those areas are already covered in Bill 42, which is the administration's measure. I'd also like to point out that the CD1 is still a work in progress, and so additional revisions can be made to further define geographic and specific street boundaries and to address whatever concerns council members may have. I'd also like to reiterate comments that I made at our last regular council meeting that I had wanted to incorporate these amendments into Bill 45. However, I was advised by the Corporation Council that these amendments to include geographic boundary restrictions would be inconsistent with the existing purpose clauses of Bill 45. Since Section 3-202 of the Revised City Charter prohibits amendments that change the original purpose of a bill, Corporation Council recommended that an entirely new bill be introduced to avoid violating the City Charter. And I've distributed copies of the Corporation Council's opinion in that regard to each of the Council members. And finally, the proposed CD1 could be viewed as an initial effort which could eventually lead to an island-wide sidewalk ordinance. If this CD1 is enacted into law, we will have the opportunity and time to evaluate the effectiveness of the law and its enforceability. If the law proves to be beneficial, the Council can always consider adopting other ordinances in the future to include other geographical areas in the city. In this regard, I believe that the proposed CD1 represents a legally defensible, reasonable, and measurable approach in addressing an important issue of concern for the residents of our island. That's the proposed hand carried CD1. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the Chair would also like to Thank Council Member Fukunaga and Council Chair Martin for joining us this morning. Members, any further remarks on any of the, uh, the two measures before us before I call up the administration? Okay. Would the Housing Director please come forward? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Could you please state your name for sure. the Sure. My name is Jun Yang. I'm the Executive Director for the Mayor's Office of Housing. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Director Yang, for being here. Uh, Director Yang, can you please uh, tell the committee uh, where the administration is at currently uh, with your comprehensive affordable housing analysis, first of all? Second of all, could you also uh, discuss where the administration is currently at in regards to implementing an affordable, uh, a housing first initiative? Sure. So um, currently, uh, we are working together with all departments regarding our um, island-wide housing policy. Um, our departments, Department of Planning and Permitting, especially uh, with Budget Fiscal Services, uh, Department of Community Service, uh, Customer Community Services, we're getting together to create a comprehensive uh, island-wide uh, policy to look at how we can implement, uh, um, create more affordable housing for our working families and for those in, in lower income. Um, and we will be coming before the City Council uh, sometime in the future to be able to discuss this uh, about our policies uh, very soon. 
Uh, regarding our housing first, um, through the, you know, as, as I've, I've come and spoken to the council before, our point in time count has given us uh, an idea of how many homeless that we have on our street at, at any given time. Um, from that, we have come to realize that our, our uh, highest population of our chronically homeless individuals are in Waikiki, downtown Chinatown, and in the Waianae Coast area. Uh, for these reasons, we have chosen to focus our Housing First uh, uh, initiative in these three areas. Uh, working with the Department of Community Services, uh, we are trying to get, we are working to get our, our RFP out uh, as soon as possible, and that will be um, sometime in October. The target for the RFP um, is our chronically homeless individuals, because that is the um, uh, the population of our homeless uh, that are on the street that need the most resources um, and also do are the most vulnerable and our service provider network um, they do their best to provide services for all the homeless that are on the street and in shelters uh, this is a population that um, not because they are not wanting to but because the resources have not been the tools have not been available to them until now to be able to uh, specifically help and administer um, housing services and case management uh, services for this population. So that's the reason why we've chosen this population to work with. Uh, Director Yang, is what part of the plan does the administration plan to roll out in August? The reason I asked that our understanding was that the administration uh, does have a plan to roll out part of what is being considered in the month of August. Can you share that with the committee? Mm. Sure. This is the, the director for the Department of Community Services. Good morning. Pam Whitty Oakland, Department of Community Services. Good morning. Um, Chair Anderson and council members, we are working on our RFP, which will be issued in August, and we will have a contract with a provider. Our target date is to have a contract with a provider for Housing First in October. So the RFP will be rolling out in August, okay? And that's where we are at this moment. Okay, so the RFP will be issued in August. You expect to have a contracted provider uh, by the time the month of October is over. That is correct. And we've been, the, the providers are very aware and anticipating the um, RFP. Okay. Thank you very much. Members, any questions for the administration? Council Member Pine. RFP for just one area or the three areas that were mentioned earlier? It's for all three. Um, wanted to ask Director Yang a couple more questions sure. to follow up on your testimony. So what is the point in time count currently? The point in time Why? count is an annual, uh, I'm sorry. Didn't no, what is the point in time count? Okay, the point in time count is an annual process that our entire island community goes through. This is. Uh, I know what it is, but what is the count? Oh, the count, sorry. Uh, for the. Um, for the island, for our homeless population is 4,712 individuals. Uh, our sheltered, unsheltered population, 1,663 individuals. And uh, for our chronically homeless, unsheltered, which is a, a subsect, uh, subpopulation, would be um, 558 individuals. Um, you know, yesterday, the, at the state capitol, state legislators mm -hmm. had a meeting uh, about the housing crisis that we have in Hawaii. Yes. And they said there's an estimate that we were going to need 50,000 units statewide in two years for affordable housing. So with uh, this RFP, how many housing units do you think that the city will be able to provide? Well, let me speak to the, um, the study that was done it's the SMS study that was commissioned by HFTC back in, in 2011. Um, at that study, at that time, uh, they projected from 2011 till 2016 that the demand for this island would be 50,000 units. Uh, if we were to say that, uh, that it's a static number or it's a, that from today till 2016 we need to achieve those 50,000 units, it would be a, a difficult thing to do. And I think it's, um, uh, we'll have to, we have to realize it's a five-year plan. They are looking at it from 2011 to achieve uh, housing the demand by 2016 would be to look at it uh, to house 50,000 people. Um, our RFP, I'll let, I'll let um, 
our director Pam would you open speak to that so the, the question just to repeat the question <coughs> how many housing units will we be able to provide exactly with RFP? the RFP will provide uh, rental assistance vouchers for up to a hundred individuals mm -hmm. So kind of short of the 50,000 that we need. Yeah. Well, if we're looking at just 50,000, that's across all the income uh, categories, all the way up to 140,000. Uh, I believe it's up to just the housing demand. Um, the, the need for our chronically homeless, the, the only information that we have is the point in time count. That point in time count tells us about 558 individuals at any given time need um, this housing intervention of Housing First. Housing First is um, the permanent supportive housing combined with intense case management for those who have the highest need. So we're still kind of short because mm -hmm. we're only going to provide 100 and we have 558 that need this type of housing. So. Councilmember, the Housing First is designed for the homeless and the chronically homeless. The study that you're referencing is a need for housing across the board of all many a much broader population and i think we spoke earlier about the city's island-wide policy to develop and encourage more affordable housing i think that's the bigger picture that lines up with that statistic that you're referencing um, our efforts to the rfp is strictly our three million dollars in our operating budget specifically targeting chronically homeless i mean we do have other monies in our cip pro um, budget that will provide some additional housing units. We are, that's still a work in progress. We're doing our due diligence and we'll be prepared to report to you at a later date on that piece of it. So we're still short about 458 housing units for housing first or the chronically homeless. So are there efforts to work with the state government to fill that gap? Absolutely. Um, and what we've come to find is that data um, is the most important thing that we need at this to find the real need. Uh, the point in time count is something that's done January 22nd, around that time, uh, end of the month in January every year. Uh, it incorporates using both service providers and uh, volunteers to go into as many places as possible to find our homeless on the street and in the shelter. Now the questions may not be as, um, uh, as comprehensive as when we do our coordinated assessment, the tool that I had mentioned at the last council hearing. Um, this is the VI SPADAT, the Vulnerability Index uh, tool. This tool will allow the service provider community to know what is the real need and how can we meet that need. What we've come to find after about 525 assessments so far, uh, I believe there's more than that today, but at the last uh, report back that I received um, last week, 525 assessments we have 30% of that need needs housing first. Uh, that would be the, the correct and right intervention for this population uh, of our individuals on the street. Uh, so we're looking at approximately 150 individuals would need, uh, 160 individuals would need housing first. We would be meeting a large portion of that need. The state also has their housing first contract signed um, and I believe it's approximately 85 uh, housing units are incorporated in that, uh, that contract. Um, you would have to speak with uh, Lori Suhako, who is uh, the uh, administrator at, at HPO, uh, the Homeless Programs Office, to get a better understanding of that contract. But I believe it's somewhere around 85 units. So we are meeting much of that need so far. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Vice Chair Harimoto. Thank you. Um, you're well aware of my opposition to these bills, so I won't go there. Um, so regarding the point in time count, how many of those homeless are in Waikiki? Through the point in time count, uh, the most recent point in time count, the um, uh, off of uh, what I remember of the report, it was uh, approximately 70 individuals from that report up to, depending on where the lines are, up to about 120 individuals. Um, you would have to go into the specific individuals in the, the uh, appendix of it, but it was a, approximately up to 120 people. Okay. So where, where are the most, mo where do most of the chronic homeless live currently? It, they're in Chinatown, downtown, 
Waikiki, um, the East Oahu, considered, and in Waianae, yes. The chronic homeless? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Director Oakland, um, one month ago at a committee meeting right here, um, I really apologize. I, I, I'm so disturbed by what we're trying to do here that, you know, I, I, one of my rare moments that I really went after the administration on this. But, um, you know, I'm concerned now that we're hearing at that time, one month ago, the administration said we would have things in place in August. And I said, there's no way. And that's when I really started to get after the administration. Today we're hearing that the RFP will go out in August, but you're targeting October for the contract. So of course, nothing can be done until you have the contract in place. That's so correct. am I hearing now one month later, we're saying nothing will happen until October at the earliest. Is that correct? Yes, and if I, I could elaborate, we have, we have a commitment to participate with the state's SAMHSA grant. This is a federal grant that the State Department of Health has for chronically homeless who are severely mentally ill and also um, suffering some, from substance abuse. We have a commitment to partner with them on 10 vouchers. We expect it, and, and they're under contract. However, their providers are not ready to totally implement. So that's the delay we're experiencing. We have that commitment. We anticipated when we had that conversation with you earlier that they would be ready to hit the ground running and we're encountering some delays there. So rather than give you data that's relying on someone else's contract, I'm telling you what we will do with our own contract. Okay, and that actually was kind of my point. You know, I'm what is within our control? This 10 unit, by the way, 10 is far short of 100, but uh, you know, that's not within our control. We don't know what will happen with those 10 units. And uh, I think it was a mistake for us to even count on that. But clearly, what is within our control is our city efforts with the RFP that you are planning to issue in August. And now you're saying the contract targeted for October. But here's the real question. When are we actually going to have units in place. What is the commitment that we will have things in place ready to go? We are operating on a parallel path. We are, um, Mr. Yang in, is attending various community organizations and outreaching to realtors and property owners to develop those relationships. Our providers, we meet with our providers on a monthly basis as well. Those who are currently um, utilizing the voucher programs that are other HUD funded programs with funded by our department. They have existing relationship with landlords. They are talking to the property owners to, in, to continue to cultivate those relationships and be aware of units as they come online. It's a function of getting the contract signed and getting the money on the street so that they can actually implement. But those relationships exist. We have over 600 shelter plus care. Yes, that's right. It's over 600 Shelter Plus Care vouchers that are already out in the community. And it's a very similar, it's, it's a different name, but it's a very similar program to Housing First that have been out there for many years. And so it's those relationships with existing property owners will be, we continue to cultivate those relationships and look for additional capacity. And I appreciate those efforts, but you didn't answer the question. Exactly so. what day it's going to be a function of when the contract is signed and sealed and they can make a commitment to and enter into a lease with the landlord. Okay, so here's, here's my concern that one month ago it was August. One month later now today they say October for contract signing. But we still have no target date of when those units will be online. Is that oh. correct? That's correct, and, and I, I wish I could give you a more absolute answer. We have a procurement process to go through. If our procurement process got challenged in any way, that's additional delays. It's a function of getting a valid contract signed and ready to implement. Um, the providers are all working now, as we've been talking for, Mr. Yang has been explaining for a long time. They've agreed to a common assessment tool. They've already assessed individuals. They've been identified. Um, we have the the housing first residents or tenants ready and available and identified. Um, the relationships are there with the landlords. It's really a matter of having an executed contract so we can move forward. 
And I understand and I appreciate your response. I understand the process. But again, when we, if we approve this bill, 42, targeting Waikiki, I'm assuming the mayor will sign it. The way it's worded is, it is effective immediately. I understand. Assuming we're on course with approving this bill in August, perhaps, we're nowhere near being online with these units. We are so, not, I'm sorry, excuse me. So that was my whole argument last month. If we are saying we need to approve this bill to make it illegal to lie and sit on sidewalks because we need to have this compassionate disruption to force homeless into these appropriate shelters without our units online, they have nowhere to go. And that was my whole argument against doing this immediately. So the follow-up question then is, just to get this on the record now, there's, we know that there's many different types of homeless people, there's different causes of homelessness, but talking about the chronic homeless, if we pass this bill effective immediately with no, none of our housing first units online, they will get arrested, they have no money for paying the fine, they have no money for bail, they will be in jail, they'll have a criminal record. How is that going to help them? The one opportunity that we do have available is shelter capacity. We do have some capacity in our emergency shelters, and that is the only opportunity or option we have to offer. But they exist today. They do. And the homeless are not there. So you think passing this law will cause them to go into a shelter? I think that this is one tool of a very comprehensive effort that we're all embarking on to address the problem. And I may not be able to give you an absolute answer today on when we're going to have Housing First in place, but I can tell you that we're all very committed to implementing as many possible tools as we can to address the comprehensive problem. This is a, a tool in our toolbox. We've been advised by providers that this is something that will have an effect, a positive effect, on helping individuals make a decision to move into alternate sheltering. So what about the chronic homeless who have severe issues with mental capacity or perhaps severe <coughs> substance abuse addictions? What will they do? They cannot be accepted into many of the traditional shelters, where will they go? The only capacity for them would be the state SAMHSA grant that's already under contract. Which isn't in place. Which is not in our purview okay, to thank control. You. Point thank taken. you. I yes, think sir. I made my point. Thank you very much. Council Chair Martin. i just keep my questions brief, Chair, because I know there's a lot of people here to testify on this particular matter. You know, either one of you can answer these questions. Um, I'll try not to be repetitive of other questions being asked. Is the city's position that uh, we're in a crisis? Yes or no? Yes, sir. I think we agree that okay. we have a severe problem that needs to be addressed. It was just a yes or no question. So the answer is yes. Given that we are in a crisis and with, with powers reserved from, from the, within, the, within the mayor and the mayor's close working relationship with the governor, have we talked to the state procurement office about getting a waiver so we can immediately move forward on some of these initiatives that you, have, you are considering? Has any discussion occurred? We have had some discussion at our level. I don't know that it's gone beyond, no, not to my knowledge, Let me, not to my knowledge. So although we recognize that this is a crisis, we haven't moved forward and seen if we can exercise any type of emergency powers reserved for the governor or the mayor so that we can move more quickly sooner rather than later. I can tell you that we have had some of those conversations within the city at looking Just what our options are. That's but correct. But ultimately it requires some type of waiver from the state procurement office, right? We are aware of that, yes. Okay. But none of those discussions have occurred to date. 
it's an ongoing conversation. Okay, so it'll probably after October then, when the RFP is awarded or released. Is that is that or are we awarding contracts at that time? Because if you initiate the discussions now, by the time we settle on a potential waiver, contracts already awarded. It makes no sense. Well, why, why are we waiting? You know, I can recognize. Uh, the ambitions of the administration to do 100 rental vouchers, but that's far uh, insufficient for, I think, the number that are out there. I don't think we're going to make much of an impact. And I think it's going to get, it's going to be difficult to find 100 units with such a short time frame. I think given a longer period of time, that that's an achievable goal. But I, I recognize that the 100 rental vouchers are only for within this particular fiscal year. So going forward, how many more rental vouchers are we going to look to it, uh, secure beyond this fiscal year? Because potentially, if we're only looking at 100, potentially or hypothetically, we may only serve 100 again the following fiscal year because they're not going to be required to move out within the next 12 to 18 months, right? That is correct. In order to sustain the program, it's going to, we're spending three million, it's going to cost us three million dollars to house and provide services for a hundred individuals for one fiscal year. So that commitment needs to continue next year because that's the commitment we're making. And to the extent we want to house additional persons, we need additional funding on top of that. Um, the longer range plan is the CIP projects that have been funded and to provide rental units that are city owned and operated to help reduce the uh, voucher cost but still you've got the supportive services piece that's an ongoing expense. So it's, it's a long-term commitment and it's going to take us until year three or four where we have, or year three where we have additional inventory to be able to start to reduce the programmatic expenses in the operating budget. Okay, so if we look in at $3 million for 100 units per se, so that's about 30,000 potentially per individual that's going to cost yes. us. So very significant. Now, recognizing as these bills move forward, you know, initially I've, I've supported these bills, but I, I have the same concern as Council Member Harimoto. You know, you're going to take an assertive approach as this, but you have no other viable alternative other than these hundred rental vouchers and to take such assertive action with no other type of accommodations for the population that we need to relocate because of this situation. You know, it'd be difficult for me, I think, to continue to support these measures. Given that, what other um, alternatives are being discussed within the administration for more immediate uh, contingencies should we adopt these measures? We have had some other preliminary discussions. I'm not at liberty to get it. We're, it's, it's exploratory. I don't have any more de detail for you, but we have been working with the state. So when we talk about our capacity of 100, the state SAMHSA grant and the state's Housing First model, we actually have capacity for almost 200 individuals, which is roughly half of the chronically homeless population that we're talking about. The population at Kakako, is that chronically homeless? Honestly, I can't speak to that. I don't know what they've been indexed and what they are. So potentially they're not chronically homeless. So potentially we could serve 200, but we couldn't serve any of that population at Kakako, potentially. But that, okay. That but population is also shelter eligible. Mm -hmm. Why are they not in the shelter then? That's a choice, and that's the hard part about working with this population. I think you know that from your experience. You know, they do have to make a personal choice to want to accept the help that we're offering to them. But what are we doing to convince them that it's not the right choice? We have outreach contracts out there every day. I know, but it seems like the population is growing every single day. I mean, I go there quite frequently, and it seems we're having more and more. And the concern is we have, it seems that it's more and more families are moving out to Kaka'ako, you know, which is pretty much the predominant the areas. It's becoming a safe and healthy uh, health hazard, not just for the businesses and the individuals who frequent that area, but the families who also reside there, the very homeless families, they're at great risk. I understand that. I also understand they have capacity in the pub state public housing um, inventory for units. So our outreach workers are out there all the time. Waikiki Health and I IHS both work that area. 
you know, in your response, you say you're not at liberty to discuss other potential um, initiatives that the administration has discussed. But, you know, that's very uh, uh, convenient for you, but inconvenient for this body in the sense that we need to consider these measures. I can appreciate that. I, what I can tell you is, you know, we all know there's a whole spectrum of solutions out there. Housing First is one of many. And in our internal discussions, we're looking at anything and everything that we can, we can, we can do. I don't have anything concrete to give you a commitment on, so I don't think it would be fair to s I'm not going to put s myself on record of saying we're going to do X when we're still not solid on some of the solutions. So would your position be it be okay for us to hold off on these measures until you have something concrete? I think we have enough concrete options to ask you to move forward on this and add it as a tool to our toolbox. So to, to, to move these forward with the, with the understanding that potentially we only can serve 100 individuals? Council member, it's a function of funding Council as well. Council Chair. I'm sorry, excuse me, Council Chair. Um, we ask you for your support to put this as a tool in our toolbox. What other tools? I mean, that's, that's, that's my question. What other tools are we considering? We have Shelter Plus Care vouchers out there. We have Section 8 vouchers out there. We just opened up our wait list for Section 8. You know, when we talk about the capacity of housing, when one unit becomes available for another, there's, there's a move. There's capacity out there. We opened up our, um, we just issued 120 vouchers in our Section 8 program. So there's additional capacity. We're getting ready to take names off of that list, the 14,000 applicants that we have. Um, I just read the, don't know the date on it, but within the next 60 days, they're gonna start going through more of those applications and issuing more vouchers. All of that stuff provides for capacity. So the 125 Section 8 vouchers that you're opening, so homeless individuals and families have priority placement for those 125 vouchers? No, they don't. So potentially none of them are going to be accommodated by the 125, right? True or not true? The 125 are targeted for the chronically homeless. That is correct. So they have a preference? It is a different population. That is correct. So there is a preference. But when we talk about using the SITLI ordinance as a tool, we don't know that every person that we're affecting is chronically homeless. They could be someone who is eligible for shelter or for some of the other programs that are out there. I think that analogy is not apples to apples. Okay. Well, I don't think a lot of the responses are very definitive, uh, Zoning Chair. Yeah, are we considering uh, a potential place of safe refuge as one of the alternatives? It is something deal? that has always been on the table as an option. So that, it, that is being discussed within the administration? It has always been considered as something on the table, finding the details and uh, locating and so all that. So yes, the your response is yes. Have we identified any potential sites? No. No potential sites? Nothing definitive. Are we working with the state as to whether they have potential sites that we can consider? I personally have not had those conversations. I don't know if anyone else has. Who, who is the lead person from the city working with the state? Mr. Yang has most of the conversations with so the So, June, have you discussed this with the state? Uh, not in that manner, no, with, with locations. So we, we, haven't, we haven't coordinated with the state? No, I've talked with... Um, our uh, the I've talked with some members of, uh, in this in the state to to see what is available, um, and we we still haven't gotten any any further than that. But let me ask you this then: Is the state willing to consider a place of safe refuge as an alternative, immediate emergency initiative? We don't have that, that answer yet, so, Chair. So they, we they're don't not have even answer. not even on their radar. Well, that answer they they haven't given us a, a definitive answer yet. So. Okay. I'm just, I'm just going to end it at this point, Chair, and allow Council Member Fukunaga mm -hmm. to ask your question. But Chair, uh, I wanted to speak on one thing, um, that through the effort in the coordinated coordinated effort through our Hale Omalama, we have talked about uh, what are our resources available to us, especially for our chronically homeless and for our homeless families. Um, and can we provide, um, can we change or or allow some of our programs that are uh, established today to help uh, target populations like the chronically homeless individuals to come off the streets. So when we look at Shelter Plus Care, which has been around for, I think, about two decades, um, can we 
use those vouchers for those who need it the most, uh, those who have the highest vulnerability through our assessments. And the shelter, the shelter plus care providers have all volunteered and said yes, they would. Uh, for any of those units that are coming online through attrition, they would then take chronically homeless individuals from the community assessment um, over those who uh, they've traditionally have, have um, housed, which have been those maybe a little bit easier to uh, serve and house in the past. Okay, well, thank you. Let me ask you one follow-up question, if you don't mind. Proceed, Chair. I know we taught our great relationship with the state, so based on your working relationship with the state, being that you're the city's point person on this particular matter, this council appropriated approximately 50, well, close to $50 million for this particular issue. How much did the state appropriate last year? They, for the Housing First, did $1.5 million and another million dollars, I believe. So $2.5 million. Uh, approximately. So 5% of what this council appropriated. They've also, uh, in they were able to increase the rental housing trust fund. So this council and, and by your own representation by the administration deemed this as a crisis because the fact that it is a crisis, we appropriated close to $50 million to mm -hmm. try to remedy this issue or address this issue. It doesn't seem like the state feels it's, it's a crisis from their level with the $2.5 million appropriation. So somehow the, that lines of communication seem to be cloudy. Would you agree? Don't I can't, agree. I can't, I can't respond to that. Don't agree because then you'll have a bad working relationship with no, the state. I can't I'll respond to you. the chair. Don't comment. I'll but agree. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm done. Mr. Yang, yes. uh, or uh, Director Oakland, or uh, Managing Direct, uh, Deputy Managing Director oh, Deemer, thank you very much for joining the discussion. Thank you, Chair. Has the state been approached to assist with providing land, at least on a temporary basis, temporary meaning perhaps an 18-month basis uh, to help to be able to place people until we can get a Housing First initiative, uh, affordable housing to assist working homeless or affordable housing to assist families in place, so at least people have somewhere to go now. Have we had those discussions with the state? Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to say that um, we agree with the um, committee's assessment that having available uh, shelter or housing is an issue in relation to these bills, um, which is why we started with a smaller uh, geographic area in Waikiki. Um, but we do recognize that there is that is a problem, and we are looking at many different options. Um, we're and we are talking to the state in partnership as well. Uh, we're just not allowed to uh, give you these details because it's a little premature, um, and uh, we'd like to um, get further along before we come to you and provide you with um, more information. Because we don't want to you know, misrepresent or, or talk prematurely at this point. But we do understand and agree with your concern. Well, it's not just a concern. Uh, we need to make sure we have something yes, in place. Yes, exactly. Uh, so you're asking us to take a leap of faith, pass these out, and just trust that you folks well, are working with the state and trust their commitment. Or, uh, or let, let me just, okay. and no offense to you, uh, Managing Director, I'm not willing to, at this point, uh, take the state's word on this or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen the state not willing to provide much cocoa at all in the effort of affordable housing, housing first, assisting the homeless. They've left the heavy lifting to the city and county of Honolulu to do this. And we need to hear from them exactly what they're doing. It would help if you could at least tell us that you're having discussions with them. If they haven't committed, then please say they haven't committed. I think that's okay for us to know that. But we do need to know whether or not the Caldwell administration has at least approached the Abercrombie administration to ask for access to land, to ask for access to resources in the form of the Department of Health, Department of Human Services. Have these discussions at least taken place? Um, yes, they have taken place. It's just that we do not have a commitment at this point. Okay, so we don't have a commitment from the administration at the state level on anything? They're still in discussion. We're still in discussions. 
But um, may I, if I may add, Chair, um, the that that is the reason why we are asking for the for Bill 42 to go forward, at the very least, because we do feel that there is housing shelter space available for the chronically homeless within that geographic area. Um, we obviously can't say the same thing for a broader geographic area. Okay. Let me ask this. Is the Caldwell administration uh, considering city properties that may be, may be available to house folks on a temporary basis until what you have in mind with the comprehensive homeless plan comes online? We have been. Uh, I, I think Mr. Uh, Yang and others in the um, managing director's office have been looking for potential city property sites that, that may be used for various and, purposes. And what types of services would be offered on these city properties, Director Yang? Well, um, we're, we want to make sure that everybody going through these type of places, um, in, in our internal discussions, we're talking about ensuring that they will be connected to services connected to Housing First, uh, connected to all the resources that are available to us. But what type of housing opportunities would these be? Would these be uh, temporary shelters? Uh, what, are, what exactly are we looking at? At, uh, at this point, we're, we're looking at every option available to us uh, that's available. Yes, at this uh, point. What would we be able to facilities, implement most quickly? Potential um, facilities that city facilities that may be used for housing, um, if there is land available, um, you know, in terms of things that we might be able to put on those, on that property. Um, we're, we're trying to be as creative as possible in terms of looking at what's available to us and what could be um, creatively used for housing options. Is the administration considering anything similar to what Mayor Fossey implemented in the 1990s at Ala Park? As a, uh, I'm not asking if Ala Park is being considered. Yeah. What I'm asking is, is the administration looking at a temporary solution such as was implemented by Mayor Fossey at Ala Park at any of the properties that the city owns? Um, I can tell you that, that um, you're talking about a, a safe zone situation, so, something like a will. safe. Um, that certainly, you know, during the, the um, time that the administration has been in office, we've looked at various alternatives, and we have looked at that one. It, it has some potential um, difficulties to it, but we, we certainly have looked at that. So, so you have looked at it, meaning you're not looking at it anymore? I think it's still on the table. Still on the table being considered, or still on the table as we discussed it, and still on the table a, as a as an option. Okay. Uh, Council Member Kobayashi, followed by Council Member Fukunaga. Thank you very much, Deputy Manager Director. Uh, thank you. Following up on that, um, I have other questions. But following, since we're discussing which city properties are you looking at, uh, what have you narrowed it down to? Um, you know, I I don't have a, a list of those, but I think um, I don't know. Mr. Yang, if you can clarify, but we've actually uh, looked at the, um, through our real property division, looked at um, potential city sites that. Right, you've mm -hmm. said that. So I, I wondered but which ones are, has it been narrowed down to? Or do we still have the island, all city owned properties, or have you narrowed it down? I don't know if we've narrowed it down. Maybe uh, Mr. Yang has more at, information. At this point, um, I think it's a little, uh, we're still looking at the urban areas. We're looking in, in areas around, um, we're still exploring what sites would be um, well suited for something of that. Of so this what site. are the top three? We don't have that yet. Okay, and you said Aalo Park has some difficulties, uh, potential difficulties. What are those? Uh, I, I didn't. I don't. I didn't say that. Oh, what are the potential difficulties? Well, um, I think that uh, safety is a, a a concern. Safety. Yes, safety within. Okay, but isn't that a concern for whatever property? That is correct. Okay. Um, last year, you uh, the administration had a press conference talking about the launching of uh, Housing First. So how many um, units have you um, provided 
since that uh, conference last, the press conference last year. The press conference last year announced the homeless action plan. Right. And was. I think you were going to do 25 um, units per year. That plan had indicated the Hopi income as being mm -hmm. the, I'm sorry, the CDBG no, program it, income as its source of funding. Not, not that, not for this one. Y yes, ma'am, I beg to differ. That report referenced the program income from CDBG and the home as the this funding source. This was early source. in the administration. Mm -hmm. That's correct. It was in mm -hmm. May of 2013. Mm -hmm. And we had anticipated the program income from the sale of the city's portfolio to fund it. When that did not happen, the program has not been funded until this FY15 so, budget. But had you identified at least 25 uh, landowners that would take the Housing First clients? Not specifically, no. As I mentioned earlier, we have a group of but now providers. you have the now you have the the money, not from the Hoppy sale. Um, I believe it's about eight million that you wanted for Housing First. So at, at least if you started looking for potential landlords last year, um, do you have a list this year? Is that list still available? The proposal was to rent units, not to purchase right, units. Right, exactly. And we were dependent upon the providers who mm -hmm. have existing relationships in the community with building owners mm -hmm. to use their resources to right. find those units. Exactly. No one received a contract, so no, they did not commit any specific units to the city's program. But do you have some in mind? You already have, must have a list of... the providers Because it's very difficult to... To, to find uh, landlords that would, especially, uh, because you're concentrating on housing first clients. That's correct, and mm -hmm. we need to appeal to their moral conscience because that right. is the only determining factor. It's not just factor. homeless, but housing first clients. That's correct. That's the difficulty. Mm -hmm. And um, because, you know, uh, Chair always mentions the Kaka'ako near the medical school. Mm -hmm. How many homeless children are there in that? point in time count? That I, I can't give you that number uh, right now. I can come back to the, to the, the committee. Was well, it less than 100, less than 500, or how many? That should be, I mean, you know, having homeless children should be a, a big concern. Absolutely. So we don't know how many homeless children there are. Are in in the Kakao area, area? No, I don't. Well, not just not just in the Kakao area. Then anywhere. You can you get us that number if you Absolutely. don't have it? You don't even that. have an estimate. No, I don't have that estimate. Um, because you're the housing director, and we have those twelve Hopi projects mm -hmm. that we are probably not going to sell. We've said that already. So, and there, we were told by the administration that there are vacancies in those units. So is there, have you been looking at our own, since you're looking at city properties, have you looked at those also? Yes, we have considered our own inventory as a potential inventory that would be available. That is correct. And what have you decided? We haven't decided yet. We haven't, we don't have a contract out yet, but we do know that there are certain properties that have vacancies if they are in the target areas. We've had this conversation, I think, at the committee mm -hmm. here, that certainly our properties would be potential properties. Right. Because there's such a, I mean, if it, this is a crisis mode, a priority, um, you know, you'd think you'd have something sort of, something in mind. And the 125 that have become available through the um, the rental assist, the uh, section eight, I guess. You said those, the priority would be given to the chronically homeless? No, we didn't say that. I well, said will they be? No, they will not be. So how are we gonna, so why did you mention the 125? Because I talked about the capacity of rental units within the community. There is an existing. Yeah, we always have that. Yeah. That's correct. Because your, tr your priority though is the chronically homeless. Well, our department works all of those programs. I mean, your administration, so then, I should say. Your priority is Housing First. Specific to the Housing First uh, initiative, uh, the focus for that population is the chronically homeless individuals, yes. Okay. 
um, yeah, we're, we're concerned about the chronically homeless, but we're, I in particular, well, and I know Chair is too, very concerned about the homeless children. If you see them playing out on the street, I, I you know, do. it just gets to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Council Member Fukunaga. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps, you know, um, some of the uh, things that the Council has worked on in conjunction with the administration can help address the questions that have come up today. Um, you know, with respect to some of the um, Housing First initiatives as well and um, questions that came up about those chronic homeless that have severe mental health or other substance abuse problems. Um, I know that we have had a number of discussions with providers, with community members that also included um, representatives from the city administration as well as state administration. And I understand that uh, Department of Community Services has had some discussions with service providers who are seeking to expand their services in the downtown Honolulu and Chinatown area. Is that accurate? That is accurate. We have a, we're in a procurement process right now with Mental Health Cocoa okay. to expand their safe haven capacity in Chinatown. Okay. Um, it is my understanding further that, um, you know, the uh, Mental Health Cocoa program has made a presentation to the Downtown Neighborhood Board this past month. They did seek support from the board and the community for an expanded safe haven program temporarily in the Chinatown area, partly um, to accommodate those folks who are currently on the streets and who are making it very difficult for residents and businesses, you know, to um, survive, you know, during this very tough economic time. And I believe um, um, in those discussions, they have also mentioned that they have had a number of discussions with city administration folks as well as state administration folks. Are you aware of that? Yes, ma'am. They pro provided us with an unsolicited proposal. We are in the middle of a pro sole source procurement. I'm reluctant to get into the details of it because of the procurement process has a time frame on it. Um, but yes, you are correct. They have approached the city to relocate and expand their program within Chinatown. So I, I guess, you know, to answer a number of the questions that, you know, have been raised, um, some of the funding that has been included in the city budget is intended to help facilitate and to assist the city in serving those chronic homeless individuals who may have severe mental health and other kinds of challenges, as well as work with the um, state administration on um, a law that was passed uh, last year, mm -hmm. the uh, Act 221, mm -hmm. you know, assisted community treatment type of programs using various providers. And it is my understanding that the businesses have been working very closely with homeless providers and others, city administration and state administration folks, to see how quickly those individuals who do need medical treatment can be assisted in um, moving off the street, but to use some form of uh, housing that is going to be uh, secure and which will provide them with the kind of 24-7 and other kind of support that will help really uh, relieve the community of some kind of pressure. Is that um, something that you're also aware of? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I would like to speak on just a little bit uh, related to that. The um, Act 221 is, uh, it provides a, the community a tool to uh, help those who um, have mental illness um, be able to uh, get into resources. Right now, many of our mental ill who are on the street uh, may be connected with some case management. Uh, and the way that the, the contracts are, it's a very limited um, resource for the, the mentally ill on the street. Um, I think it's something like three hours a month. What we are able to do uh, through the state SAMHSA grant is connect these individuals who are chronically Ill, uh, chronically homeless with uh, severe mental illness uh, and have a case manager or case uh, uh, services connected to that individual uh, on a more intense, uh, with a lot more time together. Because we, we see um, many of our chronically homeless uh, mentally ill on the street here around, around the Halle as well and uh, having access to those service providers is uh, very limited at this point. So Act 221 and the uh, state SAMHSA grant will allow uh, for more resources to the, this population. 
So I guess, you know, I, I, I just wanted to add that, you know, there have been efforts within a specific uh, set of geographical areas and for certain populations to supplement, you know, what has been proposed by the city administration and that with state assistance as well as city assistance, you know, I do think that we can make a real meaningful uh, difference. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's hard to say in the context of a very broad housing first, you know, set of discussions, but I think progress can be made if we all put our respective efforts together. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to move to Chair? Council Chair? Member Menor. Yeah, well, a few brief questions. Um, I wanted to get your, your comments, Deputy Director, in regards to uh, the proposed uh, CD1 that's been offered by uh, Council Member Harimoto to Bill 42. I know the administration's position is you'd like, to, you'd like it to take effect immediately. Uh, however, Councilmember Harimoto has expressed concerns that apparently other council members have in regards to whether uh, we would have sufficient time to be able to find the sufficient and necessary bed spaces, or shelter spaces, excuse me, uh, to be able to accommodate the homeless who, who may have to relocate out of um, Waikiki. Um, I think that's an especial, especially um, important concern given the fact that if um, the uh, statute were to be challenged uh, in court, the uh, uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has indicated that the uh, uh, city and county is going to have to establish that uh, there are sufficient uh, shelter spaces available. So uh, again, I know the administration has taken the position that you'd like the uh, measure to take effect immediately, but as a compromise, as a possible middle ground, um, do you think it might be prudent for us to um, perhaps de to delay the effective date slightly to January 1st, 2015, to ensure that the uh, city will have adequate time to uh, find the, the sufficient and necessary shelter spaces. Um, thank you, Council Member Menor. At this point in time, we do believe there is sufficient shelter space for the chronically homeless in Waikiki. So we would like to ask the council to um, to stick to stick with the original. Um, uh, bill in terms of an effective date upon approval as opposed to the January 1, 2015 date. Okay, but so those shelter spaces are those that were uh, discussed and referred to uh, by, uh, by the directors uh, in response to previous questions? Uh, they're shelter, temporary shelter that don't necessarily, is not necessarily within Waikiki. Um, it could be outside Waikiki. We have approximately um, just in the urban Honolulu area, uh, uh, anywhere from uh, 60 to uh, close to 100 shelter spaces uh, on any given week. Um, yes. I see. So you're confident that uh, those shelter spaces would accommodate uh, homeless uh, individuals uh, who uh, may be impacted by Bill 42 if it were enacted into law? In, in the Waikiki area, um, the, the population uh, would we'd be able to house the uh, or shelter the, the homeless individuals on the street. Vice Chair Harimoto, uh, I'd like the follow-up questions to be very brief, please, because I would like to move to public testimony. Yes, understand. Thank you. Okay, now I'm really confused with this. I think earlier in my questioning, we clearly established that the chronic homeless in Waikiki really have nowhere to go because the chronic homeless with severe mental and substance abuse issues cannot be taken in to existing traditional shelters. And they were talking about traditional shelters having 100 spaces. But these are not places that the mm -hmm. chronic homeless meeting severe mental capacity issues or severe substance abuse issues can be accepted into because of the rules. So where did I miss? No, the um, council member, um, not every person who is homeless in Waikiki has severe that. mental illness or substance that. abuse. Um, we have a, a large population of who are not considered chronically I homeless. That. Uh, and for those with mental illness or substance abuse, it does not preclude them from coming into shelter at all. Traditional shelters. Yes, the traditional emergency shelters. So, so someone if they were, if somebody were to walk into Next Step Shelter. Uh, and have substance abuse issues. Uh, they would be asked not to use in the shelter, but if they came in having, uh, let's say they have been drinking, 
uh, it would not be something that would say that you've been you are 86 from the property you're no longer allowed into the property right I understand that but that's the crux of the matter right these people cannot help themselves if they're told you can't come in if you're inebriated or on drugs or whatever they can't go in I'm not saying that they cannot go in because they are they are drunk or they are uh, on drugs they can still access the shelter to sleep in and to to stay in uh, but they cannot use while in the shelter okay but that's that's that really is the crux of the issue mm -hmm. because they cannot help themselves they cannot control what they're doing they need help and, and that's why they're not in the shelters right I mean that that's the whole issue we're talking about and and the shelters the shelter is the the appropriate place for for many people to access these services because that is the first entry point for many of the individuals who are on the street to to have access to uh, SNAP benefits, medical medical benefits. Okay, yeah. Uh, so yeah. this, I, I I still agree that the shelter is the right place for people to get to the resources that they need because it's very difficult uh, otherwise. Okay. I'm not an expert on this, but I totally disagree. If that's true, then why are we going with housing first? Why the 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 forty-seven million dollars for housing first? If what you're saying is true, for accessing that, resources, that's contrary to everything that we've been told earlier. No, for accessing resources to be connected to these benefits, for a homeless individual who are, who is coming into homelessness, this is the place that our system has created, our our island-wide system, and not just here in in Honolulu or Hawaii. It is just a national practice that all of our all of the homeless shelters and programs are connected together. Um, so for, for our system here, traditionally, for someone to be able to access SNAP benefits, food, sta uh, food stamps, general welfare, um, and uh, access to housing, uh, people have had to go into uh, a place like IHS or Next Step to be able to get uh, someone to work with them, a counselor or case manager. Regarding housing first, what we are doing within our resources now is working with service providers to go out into the street so that they can find the individuals and be able to bring them into housing. That's what, this is a whole change in, in philosophy to be able to bring the resources to them. But that's for, specifically for a chronically homeless, the resource that's available to them is Housing First. For those who are not uh, chronically homeless, uh, to be able to access the, the traditional uh, housing resources, the mainstream resources that are out there, uh, through the assessments, through the case managers going out in the street, they will be able to connect people to give them information. We'll, we'll be able to help you over here at, at Waikiki Health Center or at case, uh, Caravan or IHS or Waianae uh, Community Outreach or Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center or U.S. Vets. You'll have to come over here or we'll try to get you someone to you to get these benefits, to get these resources, to get your information down into the system. Because there is no roving HMIS system. There is no roving. It, we don't have that capacity at this point. So for a homeless individual, at this point, still today, they will still have to go into uh, a, a brick and mortar shelter or a provider there to get that uh, connection made. But for Housing First, what we're trying to do is, is reach out and get into the streets to find those who are chronically homeless and match them up with the resources. But even those individuals will have to go into a brick and mortar shelter or provider to get all the rest of the information uh, put into the system so they, they can get connected to the housing and the resources as well. Okay, I, like I said, I'm not the expert, but I, I, I either we've been misled earlier or I just mm -hmm. disagree with what's being, being said now. But with that said, I think we seriously need to take a second look at $47 million that we're pumping into housing first. So I, I, we'll have this discussion offline. I, I'm not clear at all. I think we're oversimplifying the issues related to the traditional housing, and I totally disagree. Uh, but with that said, Mr. China, we're, we're in a timeline. But uh, since we talked about the... Um, uh, possibility of looking at these um, safe haven shelters, um, safe zones, or whatever we want to call it. Um, I just want to be real clear that if the administration goes down that path, um, I'm going to be equally opposed to that also, because I really think that's not a solution that's kicking the can down the road 
And once we have it, why should we invest money into real solutions? And I really think that's the wrong thing to do. So I'll just warn you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to move into our public uh, testimony. We are going to be taking up testimony on Bill 42, Bill 45, and Bill 48 all at the same time. For those folks who wish to testify on uh, Bill 43, as well as um, Bill 46, we'll take that up uh, right after this. So you'll also have the opportunity to testify on those separately. And then if the committee desires, uh, we'll take a break for executive session. But again, I want to allow the public to testify before we do that. Our first registered testifier is David Gerlach. Okay. Mahalo. Followed by Me Fui Moano Poi. Me Fui Moano Poi. Catherine Jean. Ms. Jian will be followed by Arvid Youngquist. I have a petition here. Sure, our committee aide can take that for you. Thank you. Good morning. Please proceed. My name is Catherine Jian. I'm the executive director of the Pacific Alliance to Stop Slavery. That is a petition of about 500 signers, both mostly from Oahu and Hawaii, and some from the mainland and abroad, potential tourists, all in opposition of all of these bills. Um, former uh, testimony stated that there is adequate housing, and there isn't. There's about 315 available shelter beds not adequate for even the chronic homeless of a little over 550. Um, not to mention that these bills, as they were deemed as tools for a toolbox, this is no tool. What this is is an AK-47 because it criminalizes innocent, nonviolent behavior. You don't want to do that. I've said that before. And what works is housing. You already have the solution. And the state has passed HB 2448, which allocates $125 million for affordable housing. Now, um, with all due respect to Council Member Ron Menor, do you really believe everything lawyers say? Now, a bill can look constitutional on its face, as written. But look at Hobby Lobby. Look at Citizens United. Look at Separate But Equal, which historically was later found to be unconstitutional. We have had a dark history with regard to internment. Internment of the Japanese, which was once thought of as constitutional. Now we're doing it, considering doing it for the poor. This is absolutely not the way to go. What this, these measures will do is prolong homelessness. And I'm going to cut my testimony short because who I feel you really need to hear from are the families. This doesn't just apply to the chronic homeless. This is applies to what uh, Council Member Kobayashi said to children who are homeless, runaway youth, and families, not just the chronic homeless people, okay? You're criminalizing these people or considering it. How would you be able to sleep at night? I wouldn't. And we heard so many people speak for them, speak for them, without knowing exactly what they go through. The consequences would be so dire, even if this was a petty misdemeanor, it would still go on their record. If one of these parents who are houseless right now gets incarcerated, what happens to the child? CPS. I ask you to consider these things. I know you are all deep down really good people, but maybe fed the wrong information that is critical to take in consideration now. Thank you. Members, any questions for Ms. Gian? Arvid Youngquist, 
followed by Samantha Priest, followed by George Sigetti. Chair, my name is Arvid Youngquist. Aloha. Members of the Aloha. Uh, may I do understand we'll be discussing 42, 45, and 48 before I proceed? 42, 45, and 48? That's correct, Mr. Youngquist. Thank you very much. Am I permitted three minutes or one minute? Uh, one minute on all items. Uh, one, uh, one minute, sir. Total. Total. Okay. I'm eating up my. Um, you know, you had a discussion with the administration, and I am part of the problem, as you were part of the problem, not so much you, because, uh, well, maybe you, because you were part of the decision making body for the not for, um, affordable housing. Earlier, when you had a larger body, the majority, which was four out of seven, were part of that deciding body. Looking at the pictures that you pointed out, I drove by that, Thomas Square. On one side, going from Malka to Makai, you can park, but Makai side of the park and Malka side of the park, you cannot park, and there's enough space just for one, what do you call that? Yes. Wheelchair. Two people cannot go walking in opposite direction of each other. Very nice. So I would recommend that the, the committee table this matter to time certain, time certain until a day after, a day after January the 1st, 2015. Don't be forced into a decision. Don't jump off the cliff. Just tell the person that's asking you to jump off the cliff, you first. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Youngquist. Members, any questions? If not, uh, Samantha Prius. <laughs> George Sigetti, followed by the Reverend Stephen Costa, followed by Max Sword. Good morning, Chair Anderson. Good morning. And, Good morning. And Council. Good morning. Thank you very much for hearing me out this morning. And I will stand on my testimony submitted in support of Bill 42, and that's the one I really want to focus on. Um, I realize that homelessness is a huge, complex, complex issue. But for Waikiki, what I've seen in my two years and living it and breathing it and walking it every single day. The demographics of our homeless in Waikiki are really a different demographics. It's, a, it's, it's one that's very transient. It's one that's very mobile. It's one that I think takes advantage of our environmentally friendly environment in Hawaii. Uh, and I will just share with you, I've had two now incidents, and I, and I like to think that I'm a peaceful person, but I had to get involved last week for the first time because I couldn't walk by it anymore and stand it where one of the homeless went after one of our visitors from Japan for a group of them to the point where they were backpedaling with nowhere to go but on Kalakaua. So I stepped in between and I said, please, leave these visitors alone. And please, pick up the paper that you've thrown on the ground and use the trash can. And he got very violent. I had to get security. But it's, a, it's you know, I understand it's complex and there's big, bigger issues. I've also... Uh, I've also gone to Kakaoko and understand that's more family driven and needs to be addressed. But for Waikiki, it's it's a different demographics. I think that it's our economic engine and they're gonna provide those visitors provide a tremendous amount of revenue, long term revenue that will give us the money that will allow us to take care of these other needs that we're talking about. So I will stand on my testimony. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you very much. Mr. Sigetti, Council Member Pine has a question for you. Yes, Councilwoman. I think the homeless, I have to disagree with you. We have the same problems in the Waianae Coast as well. Um, but if we kick them out of Waikiki, and as Councilmember Harimoto discussed, and they have, they're mentally ill, and they don't go into the shelter, where are they going to go? Uh, uh, Councilman, you're, you're, you're right. I, I don't know what portion will go. The ones that I'm seeing down there, the ones that are the, 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 the very transient, they've come here, they've got their big signs that say, why lie, need drugs, why lie, uh, need beer. 
Um, those with those four foot signs, I'm not sure if those are the ones that are going to actually move out anyway. But uh, I'm I'm hoping that this will discourage them from the from that from that type of behavior. I I do think, um, and I don't know what the percentage would be moving out. I just don't see it a big percentage. I see them as a totally different demographic than the ones that we're having to handle in the other areas. I really do. The problem, though, with that bill is they're just going to wave the same signs in, in Kobayashi's district because that's the next district over. And uh, it's very complicated to just pass that one bill if that's what this council is going to do. And I understand. I, 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 it's, you have a tough decision. Uh, you really do. And I, and I understand that. Uh, but. Uh, at the same time, I'm trying to watch out for the health and safety of all of our employees that get off work and they leave our hotels, they leave our restaurants, they get off work, they come to me and they tell me how scared they are to go to their cars after work. So it, it's, a, it's a huge issue and I, that's not to push it up somewhere, but it is, it is our economic engine. And it's something that we're all vested, we're all stakeholders. And, and we need to protect that because in the long run, that is going to generate the revenue that's going to allow you to make, give you the, give us the funds to, to do other things we want to do with house, with housing first and other issues. But uh, it, it's not just the visitors. It really is our local people getting off work saying that they're, you know, we, we, we don't feel comfortable walking from our, 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 our place of employment to our cars. Uh, and, and Waikiki's starting to smell like, um, you know, a lot of, People are urinating in the in the planters of our of our resorts, and it, it's there's a health and safety issue for everyone, not just visitors. I would tell you that. I don't know if I answered your question because I, I do know uh, I would I understand your concern. We just have the same problems in my district. You know, yeah. 400 homeless people used to li work live down the street from my house. Yeah, yeah. They, we had the same problems, but we solved it by building more shelters and affordable housing. And about 90 percent of them are now living in homes. So. But thank you. I understand the housing first and all that does need to be. I understand. Thank you very Thanks. much, Councilman. The Reverend Stephen Costa, followed by Max Sword, followed by David Morris. I am the Reverend Deacon Stephen Costa, which means I'm the boots on the ground guy out in the community. Uh, feeding the homeless and clothing the homeless. I was the lead drug and alcohol counselor for many years at IHS. Most of them are not diagnosed as mentally ill, so that's still another problem that adds to this. I, I'm against all the bills. Uh, it's, it dehumanizes them. It's not a humanitarian response. It's not loving. It's, it's, it doesn't solve anything. Have you ever been to any of these shelters? I, I'm the only one here, I think, who has known Father Claude Dutio. I was with his son two weeks ago who came to Hawaii. I'm sure he's crying today by the way we treat people. It is not a loving response. It is not going to solve them. I stayed in the shelter in Ala Park many years ago when Mayor Fossey put that up. We called it a night in the town and a bunch of priests went out and we stayed to see what it was like and it was not comfortable. I mean, it's still not a humanitarian response. I know there's a more loving way, a better way to use our resources for a better solution than criminalizing the people who are already hurt. I want you to reconsider this. I don't think Jesus is smiling. Thank you very much. Members, any questions for the Reverend Deacon? Max Sword, followed by David Morris, followed by Rick Egan. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the uh, committee. Good morning. Uh, Max Sword, on behalf of Odd Hotels. Uh, as George said, it's a complicated issue, um, but I think what we need to uh, focus on is two, I think there's two separate issues here with the same problem. You have the Waikiki issue, which is, as I understand, is like a hundred and some uh, homeless, of which I think at the last the, uh, committee hearing, it was like, what, 60% uh, from off-island. Uh, so, as was stated earlier, the, the number of homeless in Waikiki can be handled immediately. Uh, 
the issue, of course, the second issue, of course, is the, uh, the general population outside of Waikiki, out in the other districts, which are consisted mostly of families. They need to be taken care of. Those are the solution. That's a so solution to that problem is going to take a long time. Solution in Waikiki, however, we can handle right away. Simple reason. One, as I stated earlier, we can handle the small number out of Waikiki. Second, as I mentioned, the number of percentage of, of uh, homeless in Waikiki that's from off island. If you delay that, and I understand the concern, you know, you, you have to get things in place before you make things happen. However, we think that if you do the, the, the um, effective immediate date, it's going to take a little while for procedures to do this. Uh, so it'll take a couple of months. However, the, to me, the other side of that is when you, mo since most of the, the homes are from the mainland, you put this in place. We're concerned that the winter is coming up in the mainland. So we're concerned that you might see an influx from the mainland in the winter, especially if it becomes a nasty winter. But if word gets out that this is not allowed immediately, then you know that that's a that's a uh, sends a signal to those that are proposing to come from the mainland. Hey, don't do it. So while we support Bill 42, uh, we implore you that you keep the, the effective date to when it's signed, okay? And as I mentioned, it'll take a few, couple of months, two or three months to, uh, to follow procedures to get this implemented, but at the same time, we'll send a message to those planning to come here, don't come. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Members, any questions for Mr. Sword? Councilmember Pine. I feel like we're doing something of very large magnitude for 100 people. And that's what uh, Jun Yang said, the chronic homeless was about 100 people in Waikiki. And it seems like we're doing a major shift in policy and a representation of who we are just for 100 people. And so when you're saying that people in the mainland won't come, what percentage of the homeless in the mainland watch the news and keep up with Hawaii will, will know that this law has been changed? It's just maybe three people? I'm just having a hard time seeing... Well, you know, I mean, it's amazing nowadays with social media. You never know. And it's... And, the, and we know that the word is out... result of an administrative law class, I was able to select something that I found um, an issue with. Um, when I looked at the bills, I, I feel that it's a very broad-reaching prohibition. Um, I can see, particularly with Bill 45, uh, it essentially would criminalize if my daughter, my two-year-old daughter, as she got older, if she wanted to set up a lemonade stand. Um, I, I think that it reaches way too far to
Heo Gonson. Good, good morning. Quick check to make sure it was still morning. <laughs> good morning, Chair Anderson, Aloha. Vice Chair Harimoto, uh, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Rick Higgins with the Waikiki Improvement Association, and uh, we I'm testifying on both bills 42 and 43, and we strongly support both bills. And I certainly understand the. And I'm sort of like in the epicenter of this. I work in Waikiki and live in Kakaako, so <laughs> I know exactly the, the the issues that all of you feel. And and I, I think it's something that we are going through as a as a community, no question. I think that one of the things that we've got to recognize, though, that the, the bills 42 and 43, uh, which kind of started the storm, if you will, were were meant to deal with a, directly with a with a with a very uh, real problem that we have in Waikiki, and and that is that we have the the busiest sidewalks in the state that are used to uh, primarily to get around and to, to be able to uh, conduct commerce in Waikiki. Now my testimony, I won't go through it again, that talks about all the economic contributions and of course we are, we're all aware of those. The one question, if I could just quickly conclude, uh, that uh, was asked about the, the, the visitor numbers uh, actually, um, they're not as, as rosy as the headlines because the headlines are, are statewide numbers. If you look at um, Oahu only, January through May, the total visitor days are down 3.1% over last year. Uh, visitor days is, of course, the, the number of visitors multiplied times the number of days that they are here. Uh, and total dollars, even though the, the rates are higher, total dollars are down slightly. and Total visitors are down. Uh, that's just Oahu, January through May. Not it's it's very difficult to take one month in isolation because often one month figures are influenced just by what day the month ends on. If it ends on a weekend, for example, it inflates a particular month uh, year over year. So it doesn't. You always have to look at the year-to-date figures make a lot more uh, have a lot more impact than just a single month. So I'll conclude my testimony as my time is up, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Usually when there's forecasts, economists usually will explain why the decline. What was the explanation for the 3% decline? Well, the decline, of course, is, there's a lot of reasons for the decline. The, it's not just, uh, um, it, you know, there's a, the, our exchange rate is not as favorable as it once was. Um, interestingly enough, the, the Japanese numbers weren't that bad. Uh, and our other international numbers are, are, are doing um, uh, still doing well. Uh, most of our decline uh, this comes from um, the uh, domestic, uh, domestic visitors. But the number one complaint that we get about visitors is the, the, the environment on the sidewalks in Waikiki. Uh, the incident that, that George talked about earlier where, uh, you know, being able to, to uh, have another tool, and that's, that's where this toolbox issue comes into play for the, our, our police to be able to to keep the sidewalks clear is, is the reason behind sit lie. The ability to to, to uh, uh, actually have it be illegal to urinate and defecate in public. I mean, we, we you, would, you would think that that goes without saying, but I mean, I remember when I was a little kid where my dad said, make sure you come home. <laughs> So I know, you know, but nevertheless, uh, yes, it is a shame that we have to pass laws to do these things, but nevertheless, that's kind of where, where we're at. Or we wake up in the morning to the smell of urine on the streets of Waikiki, and, um, uh, or we have individuals who uh, uh, harass visitors as they walk by to, and they have, like George said, they have a sign that says, no lie, I need money for beer or, or drugs, you know, and to, to, I think one of the earlier you said, well, they would just go into the neighboring district. Well, actually, they won't, because that's well, they're they're sitting there on the sidewalk in Waikiki because that's where the money is. That's where the traffic is, the the foot traffic. And the other issue is we talk about this as a as a law to round up the. I'm not even sure those folks are homeless. You know, with what they panhandle, and uh, often if, if you read about it, and uh, many of these folks go from city to city, uh, panhandling in this in this fashion. And uh, one of the problems that we have is, is the, the other side of the coin of what makes Hawaii and Waikiki so attractive. We're such a desirable place. Can I just go back to my question? Because I don't think you answered what oh, I wanted to. So in the economic 
uh, analysis, mm -hmm. did they say that the cause for the decline was homelessness in Waikiki? Oh, no, not specifically, no. Thank you. Okay, members, any further questions for Mr. Aiken? Thank you very much, Mr. Aiken. Kim Max. Ha'aheo Gonson. David Mulenix. Jolie Tokusato. Followed by Tracy Martin. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jolie Tokusato. Um, and I just wanted to say, if there is a funded Housing First initiative and a comprehensive affordable housing plan, that's great. Then we won't need bills that criminalize the houseless. Over the years, I've had four homeless people um, come to my home. They lived with me for anywhere from two months to up to a year. One had a job. Um, one was waiting on Section 8 housing, and two were considered chronically homeless. And those were real people. I got to know them very well. And, and you know, for me, in addition for them um, being destitute and disenfranchised, imagine how, if they were still on the streets, getting arrested, entangled in the legal system, and fined, that would have pushed them further into the hole that they were trying to get out of. The last thing we need to do is criminalize the homeless. These are real people. They're, they're just like you and they're just like me. We, we shouldn't do that to them. There's, there's nothing compassionate about doing such a thing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Members, any questions for Ms. Tokusato? Thank you. Tracy Martin. Hello, good morning. Good morning. My name is Tracy Martin. I'm here with my wife and my three-year-old daughter, and we're homeless. Good morning. Uh, we live out in the Kakaako area, um, where the children outnumber the parents or the adults two to one. Uh, a lot of families are there. And I just want to share with you what the children go through. Um, the children have it the hardest. Uh, they never chose to be there and believe me, we don't want to be there. You know, I don't want to be homeless. I'm trying everything I can to get off the street. Um, sometimes it's degrading, you know. I don't know how to explain this to my little girl. The kids, they take cold showers every night. Sometimes there's no place to shower, you know. The ladies, they have to use the bathroom. They have to use the bathroom at a certain time because places close. You know, if you get caught in the park, you get a ticket. Um, trying to explain to your child why city and county or the policemen took their toys and threw them away. That's hard. Um, I've been listening to all this and Mr. Yang, I don't know where he's got his information from, but I invite any one of you to, as someone, not as yourselves though, you know, not as chairperson or council member or whatever, to go to a shelter just as someone with your family and see if you can get in tonight. You'll be put on a waiting list. You know, I don't know where they say they got bed space. We've been on a waiting list for a long time and we missed our spot because my ID got taken away. So we've been out there for nine months now. Um, and in the nine months, Kakako has grown with more and more families. I don't know why. For us personally, it's because it's centralized. There's jobs, um, welfare, um, just everything everybody needs, you know. Um, we see Mr. and Mrs. Oshiro passing out P 
peanut butter and jelly sandwiches more than we ever seen IHS come out. I think I've only seen IHS once in the nine months we've been there. Um, if it wasn't for those people, like Mr. and Mrs. Oshiro, a lot of those children would go without blankets, clothes, food, you know. There's a lot of horror stories that go on about sweeps. It paralyzes you. Parents who want to get off the street can't get a job because they're paralyzed. We never know when a sweep is coming, you know. And by the time we know a sweep is not coming, it's afternoon, you know. And that's the only time you have to go, you know, look for a job. Um, but by then, kids got to get to the showers, you know. Things have to be done, tents set up. It's a hard life. I never in my life imagined it would be this hard. You know? And believe me, I'm trying everything I can to get off the street. And things like this bill, which criminalized, my daughter's three years old today. And if this bill passes, they're gonna label her as a criminal because she sleeps on a sidewalk. You know, we have no place to go. You know? If there was a safe zone, I honestly believe there's a lot of those families would be able to get off the street. It's only because we're paralyzed. You know, we once came from society. We have a lot of personal items. Some of us don't have storage. And every sweep, they lose a little and a little more. <sighs> I mean, I understand the business owners, you know, but still, you know, it's hard. Sometimes at night, a security guard will come, three o'clock in the morning, wake you up, to get off the dirt, move the tent, get the family up, move everything off the dirt. Here comes HPD. HPD tells you, get off the sidewalk. We gotta get off the sidewalk, we're back on the dirt. It's hard. We go back and forth sometimes, daily. It depends on how either security guard or HPD feels, or what they're going through, you know. I've never been picked on so much in my life, you know, just for being homeless. It's hard, you know. I can speak for Kaka'ako because we try to, we actually have a community there, you know. We don't want to be there. We don't want to disrupt anyone's lives. We want to get on with ours. So we communicate with each other. We try to police each other. Um, but still, you know, we get the stairs. You know, we're an eyesore. You know, never planned on hurting anybody's eyes. You know. <clears throat> I just ask that you guys think about the children, because. After hearing all this, I can see clearly that the children aren't even think, thought about. You know. That's it, I guess. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here with us this morning. Members, any questions? Vice Chair Harimoto. Thank you very much for coming today and sharing. Thank you, too. Thank you, really brought face to the homeless, so I really do appreciate hearing your story. Um, many questions, but I guess I'll just ask a couple. First, you said that you don't have your ID because it got taken away. Was that in a sweep? Yes. And you can't get it back? No. And you need an ID to get in the shelter? Yeah. And of course, you need an ID to get a job? Mm-hmm. So I'm paralyzed. <laughs> and it's been made even tougher to get an ID, you know, with documents, so. Mm -hmm. So if we pass this bill, what would happen to you and your family? Worst scenario, it's like what the, the lady said, I probably go, who do you guys arrest? Do you arrest the whole family for being on the sidewalk or just 
one person. If you're on the family, if your family's on the sidewalk, it's everybody on the sidewalk. I mean, we have no place to go, so it'll just be a cat and mouse game, you know, like it already is. Yeah. So right now, when you get, when the sweep comes by, you move away. You grab your stuff. later, you go back. And then we go back. Mm -hmm. We have no place to go. No. Thank you very much for sharing. Members, any further questions for Mr. Martin? Council Member Menor. So just for clarification, you know, how many shelters have you applied to? Next step, um, my wife knows. She's the one who's been doing it. Okay, but it's been several shelters. Yes. And you've got pending application before several shelters. Yes. And you're saying that on all of those shelters with respect to uh, the applications that you had submitted, that uh, you're, you're on the waiting list for all of them? Okay. There's uh, not only me. There's a lot of other people. Uh, are you... I, either you or your wife, or your wife currently employed. You're not employed. No. Are you Are you looking for employment? Yes. What kind of employment are you looking for? Um. I was a chef before, but since being homeless, um, I've been learning a lot of maintenance and stuff. Been building things for the people out there. You know, putting things on wheels so it can get away fast. But um, uh, looking for maintenance work, handyman work. So. Did your wife want to add something in regards to my question about the uh, availability of shelter space? Yeah, there's been maybe about three applications that's been denied because of his identification issue. Um, when oh, can you speak? Oh, closer? I'm sorry. Could you push the microphone a little closer to you? Um, sorry. There. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> Please proceed. Okay, so like his ID has been a big issue with him because everything that states who he is, his social security card, his birth certificate, his marriage certificate, and his ID, his state ID card, has been taken in a sweep. And it wasn't, okay, I thought the law was you could take your ID and your medication, right? But because everything is so frustrating for us, my husband had, you know, had a hard time to express in a more calm way of what he was feeling that day to a police officer. They told him if he was to touch anything behind the red tape, he would get arrested right there. And because I said something, he would arrest me. Take my child away, call CPS. Compassionate disruption uh, is nothing like it says, uh, I don't know where the logic is in that. I've seen a woman who just given birth a week ago with a little infant. A sweep came, took all the baby's diapers, the baby's formula, the blankets, tent. I did it. And she had nothing. She had nothing that night, and it was raining, it was pouring. You know, I don't wish this on anybody. I just wish people would think a little bit more in depth, like the children who's been forgotten. And as mm -hmm. for the um, uh, these outreach people coming out, um, IHS has only come out once. And they came out the day after we were on the media. One time. Okay, yeah, one one quick follow up. So your husband, I asked a question about the, the fact that you were, your husband says that you are on the waiting list with respect to several no. shelters. Is See, that correct? We were on a waiting list for one shelter, but that got denied as soon as he wasn't able to present an ID. But why now? Well, I mean, well, we've been offered from Mr. Yang that uh, to go into Next Step Shelter. But what about the families before us that were on that list? Because technically we're not on the list, right? So uh, why show us favor? Let me explain. Uh, after being on the news, we've had um, Mr. Yang come out and ask us, well, offer us to get into the shelter right away. 
because I lost my ID. I refused because there is a waiting list and why should I go ahead? You know, because I was on the news, you know. That's not fair. And I'm pretty sure it'll make some people mad. And we're already down, you know. So we just wanna be fair. You know. A lot of families have already applied for shelters before us and we don't want to jump in front of them. Yeah, I'm going to clarify, Chair, that Bill 48 does not include Kaka Ako. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member uh, Fukunaga, you had something that you wanted to add? No, no I didn't have any questions. Okay, did you want to add anything about uh, the IHS, Waikiki Health Center at all? Oh, okay. Um, I believe that the Kaka'ako area is under um, contract by Waikiki Health Center. I don't know mm -hmm. if Waikiki Health Center has approached you. Yeah, that's what we've, we've heard. Next step. Last week. Is that next step? Yeah. They operate next step shelter, yeah, and they, I, they I do, do believe they have outreach workers, you know, in that area. I believe yeah. IHS is kind of more in the um, uh, downtown Chinatown Kalihi area. Yes, they have, came, um, they have come last week, I believe also after the media. But the, the other Next Step sh uh, workers that do come around, they try, They used to pick up the rubbish around the Kaka'ako area. But they've been, I guess, neglecting um, Oha, or Ohe Street. And I'm not sure why, but that there used to be a rubbish can that the city and county took and deemed that uh, no trash zone or something. But we worked with HCDA and they getting got a us dumpster, a dumpster. And stuff. We are people who are trying to coexist with yeah. the normal citizens. I and mean, if you go to Kakako now, mm -hmm. we've worked, we've really pulled together as a community, you know, a homeless community. And I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but we work, uh, we've got each other's backs more than a regular community does. But this kind of bills is making us chronically homeless too, you know, not just the guy with the mental health issues or the drug addiction, yes. this My kind of bills will also make I mean, us. He, he never, you know, planned on getting a heart attack, yeah, he never planned on staying in the hospital, being hospitalized, unable to work, he didn't plan on losing his job because he wasn't able to go back at full capacity, so, I mean, and a lot of families aren't out there because they're drug addicted or, you know, mentally ill. They have kids. And as a community, we watch each other's backs for those kids. I think that's the reason why a lot of more families have been coming to Kaka'ako when they lose their homes. And to answer your question about Waikiki, they're slowly making their way to Kaka'ako. So. Thank you. Members, any further questions for the Martins? Thank you. Mr. Martin, Mrs. Martin, thank you very much for being here with us this morning. We don't have anyone else registered to testify on bills 42, 45, or 48. Is there anyone else here with us who would please come forward? Good morning, Uncle. If you just please state your name for the record before you offer your testimony. Aloha, Kako. Aloha. My name is Lancelot Haili Lincoln. I am a direct descendant of Kamehameha who wrote that paddle law here in Hawaii. And it still stands today. I must remind every one of you. Bene, I, I commend you for taking that step to not allow these other people to make our homeless people criminals. I've been to prison a few times. Been there, done that. I know what it's like. It's no place for these people. So all you got in prison is hate, anger, hurt, and pain. We cannot cause this for these children. 
There's a lot of children out there in Kaka. I've been there. I feed those people myself. Bring food to them. I bring donuts to the children there. There's a lot of them there. We have people like this all across our land. It is not their fault that drugs was brought into our islands and they became, many of them, drug addicts. A lot of them are not. A lot of them even work. Yeah. Please, do not allow this to happen. Do not criminalize these people. These people down in Waikiki, after I'm done with school at KCC, twice a week I walk through Waikiki. I go to have dinner there. I have never had no problem with no homeless. Nobody ever approached me. I never seen them approach any tourists. They mind their own business. They stay to themselves. They have nowhere to go. Until you people build low-income homes for these people, I must say you cannot pass these laws. Absolutely not. Until they have somewhere for them to live, these laws are not to be passed. These people talking from Waikiki, the, the managers of Alriga, I'd like to ask them, how many rooms do they have available for these homeless people? You talk about tourists coming here spending money? These people's families are taxpayers just like the rest of us. They spend more money here than any tourist that come to our land. Is here for five days, tops. What money are they spending? Compare that to the money your taxpayers spending here in Hawaii. Please, not for the tourists, not for nobody. This is against the law. You cannot do this. You cannot make laws like this to criminalize these people. That is wrong. I will not stand for it. I promise. Members, Thank any you. questions? Mahalo. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Please come forward. Please state your name for the record and offer your testimony. I think it's good afternoon, Chair and um, committee members. I feel like this Groundhog Day. I think we've been three times through this. You know, when I first came up with this two and a half years ago, I expected it to be for Waikiki only. And I agree with the gentleman who just came before me and the nice family that outside of Waikiki, it's clear the city does not have its act together by its own testimony. However, Waikiki, no matter what the others say, is a different bunch of people. They're not going to go to Kimberly Pines neighborhood. They're not, they might go to Alamoana Beach Park. That's about as far as they're going to go. I think I talked about this before. You know, I saw a guy the other day laying on the bus bench with his ass hanging out, and this is not the first time. Um, I, and, and they're not that friendly. You know, I'm, I'm pretty well known in Waikiki. If I decided to have a run for this council seat, I might well be the guy sitting there in place of Mr. Chang. And uh, people call me the mayor of Waikiki or the something starts with B of Waikiki. Uh, but I know a lot about what's going on, and I live and I reside there, and a lot of people who are against this bill don't, and they don't know what's happening. I clearly implore you to help us pass this. And Mr. Har Councilman Harimoto, I agree with you on the January 1st thing, because it's quite clear that they don't have their act together to do anything. However, there is a little park on the side of uh, Aloai Beach Park, Aloai Golf Course. There's a little grassy area there. That could be a safe zone. Um, I think what, however, on the other hand, as a compromise, you could just pass it and say until they, they prove that they have, they have a, like a bus and a shuttle bus that takes someone or give them bus passes to get them to this safe zone or to these places. And the other day when I mentioned the shelters were full, yes, they were full the night before. The nice lady from my hometown um, obviously had walked in on a conversation she knew very little about. But I really think, you know, and I, and I know a lot of small business people and I know a lot of residents and they're waiting for this thing to pass, and they're going to be very, very disappointed if it doesn't. And outside of Waikiki, you can't do it. And I, I support Mr. Councilman Maynor and Councilman Anderson. I understand the needs of your community, but the city has to get its act together. And these people who are here, maybe they could reach out to people in the public who know something about 
other than sitting in office and having meetings, like my Mrs. John here and others like her and the, and the pastor, they know what to do, but for some reason they don't want to include anybody in these conversations. What kind of bureaucracy are they creating? And if you do the math, clearly you can't afford to house everybody at the rate that it's going, can you? But you can get rid of the people in Waikiki because they will leave, and they're already talking about it. I talk to them. I know them by name. They're not from here. They're hobos. They're not, they're there by choice. They're not there because of what this poor gentleman had to go through or others like him who are from here. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions for Mr. Moskowitz? Thank you, Mr. Moskowitz. Is there anyone else here who has not testified who would like to? Please come forward. Hello, my name is Steve Miller, and I really think um, you're putting the cart before the horse here. Uh, there, obviously, there's a, not, a lot of need for mental health facilities, drug and alcohol abuse facilities, homeless shelters for families, and you're going to criminalize them before you get these options in place. And I think that's the mistake. I mean, something happened in this building yesterday that brought business to a standstill. It wasn't a power outage. It wasn't a bomb scare. It was the bathrooms didn't work. And now you want to tell people, okay, you're going to be criminalized for basic human functions without giving them an option of somewhere to go. You're, you're, it's, it's, you're approaching the problem from the wrong direction. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions for Mr. Miller? And anyone else want to testify? Please come forward. Mrs. Wood? Yes. Hi. My name is Annabelle Murray. I'm an attorney at the Children's Law Center. Thank you for letting me speak briefly because everyone's been so eloquent. I don't have a lot to add. But the fact that the, the folks that spoke to you initially from, I guess, the mayor's office don't know how many homeless children are here in the city of, in county of Honolulu, that they couldn't give you a number, um, seems to me incredible. It was very easy for me to find out uh, just a couple days ago when I asked. I had to do a little bit of digging. There's over 600 children who are listed as homeless in the DOE alone. So that doesn't take into consideration uh, the children who are no longer going to school or all the children who are not old enough to go to school. And one of the things that I was doing here today was just coming to listen because I don't want to just start talking and not really knowing what's going on and who's talking and, and what the different positions are. And the other thing I did is I've gone down to Kaka'ako for a couple of days and walked around and I've made a couple of commitments to those folks which I need to keep. One is to bring books and to read to the little kids and the other is to bring school supplies. But we have to remember, the school supplies need to be replenished because they're being taken. Sorry, Please I get proceed. nervous. I'm not a great speaker. Please proceed. The school supplies are being taken in the sweeps. The school bags are getting taken in the sweeps. How about we come up with a plan that there's a sticker that's not so obvious for these poor kids who are homeless and don't want to show it off to their classmates so that when someone's coming in to take everything, they know, don't take the school bags. 600 kids in those schools. And I get very, it's, it's been a very intense sort of process looking and watching all this. So I may, you know, my voice is shaking a little. If you arrest parents, the kids will go into CPS. They'll go into foster care. It's a huge cost. The only good, th there's nothing good about it, so I don't want to say there would be, because no, these parents aren't abusing their children. Homelessness is not, is not considered abuse and neglect in the state of Hawaii, nor should it be. What, if these children were in foster care, they would get services, and their parents would get reunification services. And there would be an entire system set up to ensure that these children would be reunified with these parents in a safe and stable home. It's unbelievable to me that we're talking about having these parents criminalized. 620, 40, I'm, I'm not sure of the number, over 600. I do the know, know the number. Somebody could call DOH and find out. These kids have school bags that are being taken in sweeps. They have clothes. They have books. I want to bring books to the little kids in, in Kaka'ako. Those kids have told me they will get taken in the sweeps, and they will not get them back. I don't know where they go. Do they go in the trash? So it is about the children. It has to be about the children. And the fact that nobody had that number, and I was able to get it in about three hours, just is amazing. So thank you for listening. Members, any questions? Anyone else would like to testify who had not? Ah. 
Still, morning. Still good morning. <laughs> uh, good morning. My name is Shannon Wood. Uh, t uh, in 2002, uh, my husband and I established uh, an, an organization called the Windward Homeless uh, Alliance, and I started working with um, uh, neighborhood boards and uh, community organizations and churches from Makapu'u all the way up to uh, uh, to Haleiwa. Uh, and then uh, it became uh, part of the organization, the 501c3 organization in Woodward Ahupua Alliance about three years ago. Um, and I wanted to let you know that I am very, very concerned about the, the, these particular bills because they are they, they if we had places for people to live and to be able to get services and so forth and we're still doing this that's one thing but right now it doesn't it really doesn't work um, I wanted to let you know that there are three things that uh, that have come up uh, from yes from yesterday I got this email in uh, this morning from uh, uh, State Senator uh, Suzanne Chan Oakland uh, from her uh, committee chair it says uh, this was a, she he forwarded a release from the um, the uh, Thelma Dreyer uh, f uh, from the uh, State Senate yesterday there was an an evaluation of uh, they held held, held a, an issue dealing with um, homelessness and affordable housing. Um, I what I will do is as soon as I get to some place to be able to do this, I'll forward uh, forward this to you. But it's extremely important. Next week, next week on Friday, February first at ten o'clock in the morning across the street in room three o nine. The Committee on Labor and Public Employment and Committee on Judiciary and Labor will be holding a uh, informational briefing about the Community Services Block Grant, and this is for both, uh, not just the state, but for the counties as well. And then at uh, from 11 to uh, 1 p.m. the same day, the Housing and Homeless Task Force meeting will take place on Friday, uh, August 1st from 11 to 1 p.m. Meeting will be held in State Capitol Conference Room 229. And I guarantee you that more than just a bunch of people, bureaucrats sitting around yapping at it w with each other, the, in particular the task force, we have had people, homeless folks show up, uh, uh, faith uh, organizations, uh, NGOs like ours, and so forth. I, uh, what I w really urge you to s seriously consider the possibility that you're going to have to build county jails if you're going to have pass these bills. The other thing is is about the urination and defecation issue. Is is there going to is it okay if uh, three year old children are okay if they uh, poop on the on the sidewalk or are they going to be arrested as well? I mean the thing is is that is that you know for I know that all of many of you have <laughs> children or grandchildren now, and you know exactly what it is, it, it, what it's like to have to deal with children. But in any case, what I, I at this point, I'm going to ask you to de not necessarily kill the bills, but defer it until we make sure that there is money coming from the federal government, the state government, NGOs, and the, the county, and start working on, uh, I'm actually working with the Department of, of Planning and Permitting and uh, the Office of, of Housing uh, of, about a, a place in uh, here in uh, urban Honolulu about finding three to four uh, uh, buildings for uh, permanent housing. And that it's stuff that, that these, are, these are buildings that where there is infrastructure is there, it's decent, it's close to transportation, education, uh, and, uh, and jobs. So it's, it's not in Herb, it's not in Waikiki, and it's not Kakako, it's uh, in the Kalihikai area. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions? Don Eads, followed by Lisa Mitchell. Good morning. Good morning. It, it is still morning. It is. Aloha, no. 
Um, I think the last time that I was here before the City Council was uh, when Mayor Jeremy Harris uh, recognized my kids as uh, outstanding educational role models. Uh, some of you know who I am, most of you probably don't, doesn't really matter. Uh, I think it's important to make qualitative distinctions. Uh, my kids did not come from Silver Spoons, and they certainly had experienced homeless along the way. But my son Michael now works for NASA. My daughter, Heilani, is in her third year of medical school in Israel. And my youngest son, Hoku, uh, grew up with me in China, skateboarding the Great Wall, and is also now in the Air Force National Guard here locally. All Keiki Okaina. These qualitative distinctions that we make, see, we have a tremendous opportunity to send a signal to not just the poli political process, but to the community at large that it is possible for us to work together as a community and resolve these issues in other ways. Couple of quick suggestions. Number one, indestructible bathrooms and shower facilities are needed and they're needed where people are, not just moving people around to where they aren't. I have a ruptured kidney and uh, I sometimes have the urgency to go. I have to go, I, I have a ruptured kidney. And uh, try to find a place downtown to go to the bathroom if you're in that situation and I'm certainly not homeless. I'm pursuing my second PhD in the College of Education right now and I'm just about completed with that. One other thing I think that uh, is a reasonable solution in addition to indestructible facilities, we need those, is to consider that we are, as members of the community can begin to go back and adopt those uh, traditional Hawaiian ways. Growing up here, Ohana Nui is a very important thing. Wow, now we're suddenly all of these people that are factionalized. A qualitative distinction needs to be made in terms of what type of actions we take for the betterment of our entire community in the long range. And that betterment to me is, hey, every single person here, and I think it's been maybe more than a hundred today, but it could plant a seed if every single one of these people decided to just adopt one homeless family. One Keiki Oka'aina. <coughs> And make sure that you don't just hand out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, although I'm not against that. But I've, I'm, I've been the international coordinator for the Tony Robbins Foundation for, oh what, 16 years or more now? We feed three to five million people every year, internationally. So my expertise is not in the problems of Honolulu. My background's in China-US relations. China has much worse problems than we do in these areas. But I think it's very important to not just feed or house people, but to give them the tools to turn it around. We talk about toolkits, but what about toolkits that work? Apparently, listening to the city people talk today, they have a great toolkit but they don't seem to be working. How about if we consider a qualitative distinction that would produce results that work? And I've given three suggestions that I think might work. Mahalo. Thank you. Members, any questions for Dr. Eat? Thank you for being here. Lisa Mitchell, is there anyone else who would like to testify who has not after Lisa Mitchell? Okay. Hi, Lisa Mitchell, thank Hello. you. Hopefully you folks have softened your hearts since the last time. And I feel like, yeah, everybody has given really great testimony and I feel like the city is, should be commended on doing a good job in terms of trying to find solutions. And that being said, I believe you don't need this law. You don't need to have such pressure put upon those that are gonna suffer the most from it. And as you've already seen, they do suffer. I don't see how you can negate that. There's just no way around that. 
and it's very real. And it's compassion that's needed. We get enough disruption in the world. <laughs> So I hope you folks really change your attitude and mind hearts about these bills. Thank you. Yeah. Members, any questions for Ms. Mitchell? Yeah. Please come forward. Is there anyone else who would like to testify after this lady who has not? Okay. Is there anyone else after Mr. Holly who would like to testify who has not? Okay, we'll close public testimony on these items after Mr. Holly. Please proceed. Good morning. My name is Lisa K. Meyer. I'm a resident of Kapuhulu. Um, I also frequent the Waikiki area. A lot of my friends are also residents of the Waikiki area. Um, haven't met that. Haven't met you before, <laughs> Mayor, the Mayor of Waikiki. But um, I am <laughs> um, also. Um, I currently do therapy as part of my practicum and intern with clients, and a lot of them are homeless um, families and individuals. I have also been a mental health specialist with case management agencies and volunteered at a lot of homeless resources and shelters. Um, although I can empathize with the businesses and residents affected by what we call deviant behaviors and choices of the homeless, um, there are many factors that we've seen other cities that have tried to do this that show us that these are ineffective, they don't work, um, they're inhumane, they're not cost effective at all, actually a waste of time. And the target, the goals of these bills actually go to waste and it ends up targeting the people that we don't intend to. Um, these bills do not work. Um, I've talked to a lot of Chamber of Commerce um, and the representatives of businesses and other states that have, um, I mean cities that have enacted this to save time. Um, I spoke to Melody Bassett. She's a Chamber of Commerce rep for downtown businesses in Chico, um, California. Um, she said the bill itself did not work, um, the actual bill. Um, there was other things that worked that hopefully I'll get to, but what ended up affecting it in that state, in that city, and other cities was the lack of resources, so enforcement, pretty much. And we know in Hawaii, we really don't have those resources as well. We've seen from all the robberies and the crime that has been going on, we don't have the resources. Um, as well as um, law enforcement abandoned it. So like in some cities, law enforcement couldn't even continue doing it because they realized it was ineffective. You get repeat offenders um, also you know, they realize that they are targeting and affecting families and children. And a lot of times there are individuals with mental illness or physical disabilities that they realize, you know, they're targeting wrongly and it's not a choice that they're choosing, but actually their only choice. Um, These bills also, my second point, these bills are also a financial burden, more so to the city's economy because of the required resources. You need more police officers. You need to educate the police officers on how to gain rapport and treat um, the individuals so that there aren't fights, there aren't more conflicts. Also, um, all these meetings, as well as the research that, that will be utilized after. So imprisonment, which causes more money. Also, a lot of times, those with mental illnesses, they get more hopeless. And in order to find some place where they're not going to be um, targeted or criminalized, and also because they become more hopeless, hopeless, they go into the ERs, into inpatient treatment, which actually causes costs us more money. And um, as a result, and these bills, um, they are unconstitutional, unconstitutional, unethical, uneducated, redundant, considering how many cities have done this and it hasn't worked. Um, like Portland, I think it and expired and they have to redo it. San Francisco isn't enforcing it no longer. And in Chico, they're actually using other means that everybody has talked about here today, other solutions that are effective and cost efficient. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Okay. I need to ask you to please conclude. Okay. Um, so Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So as I've said, these bills um, are a waste of time, a waste of money. Inhumane are likely to cause more problems. Um, you can't make um, decisions, especially if you know it doesn't work. And I don't think in any cities has shown any real 
um, solutions. Like it hasn't really worked. Um, what has worked though in the other cities um, wasn't the bills itself, but private organizations or even the city um, funding um, more cost effective and solutions. So like even the Chamber of Commerce, the businessmen in Chico actually banded together and made an ambassadors group that they actually were out, outreach teams that went into the community and they built rapport, they educated the homeless, they educated themselves especially on mental illness, physical disabilities, homelessness, and they ended up solving the solution. But the only thing about this, we don't know how long that's gonna last because you know, after a while, the businesses feel like, shouldn't the government be doing this for us, <laughs> you know? So um, also, you guys are role models. Um, when we saw an increase in the sweeps, we also saw an increase in um, civilian murders against um, the homeless. So you guys are role models to our youth. And if they see you guys treating the homeless in a certain way where their targets, their problems, you do stigmatize them further, and you do end up the youths will end up labeling them the same way. But um, thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any questions? Okay. Mr. Holly? Good morning, Chair. Committee. Good morning, sir. My name is Willie Holly. I'd like to uh, present a face of homelessness that Mm, we generally don't see. Those are truly like the ones who we say are mentally ill outside of our drug abuse issues. Roughly this time last year, I started advocating on behalf of a name, a lady named Mrs. Lee, chronic homeless person, living at bus stop, following the bus stops, et cetera. Just short synopsis of what happened. Through the efforts all the way through um, council member Fuganaga's office, Mr. Jun Yang's office, all the way to the mayor, the mayor's office in County of Honolulu. Mrs. Lee was arrested, taken to Queens Hospital, given treatment for 10 days, and released. I saw her again yesterday, sitting in front of district court in exactly the same situation that Mrs. Lee was for the last eight years, she's been out there. So the policies, that whatever they are that the city and county or the state has, are ineffective. They don't work. That policy needs to shift. Another short comment on defecating and urinating in downtown Honolulu. I'm sure you're aware it's against the law already to do that. Or are you not aware of that, that it's against the law to do that already? It's against state law. As a matter of fact, the fine two sessions ago was increased for doing that in Honolulu. So I do not understand why you want to pass laws that are already on the books. It's against the law to urinate and defecate in public. You know, why is this necessary? You know, yesterday I walked by uh, Remington College and on the bench where the smokers go, someone had defecated right there. This is right off Bishop Street, right downtown. And I spoke with the security guard there for a few minutes about what implications this might offer if this were to pass. First of all, a police officer or someone in authority must witness the act so that your neighbor can't point at you and say you did it or you did it. Are you aware that that, that must take place before anything can happen? Who's going to be responsible for taking evidence to court? Is that the police officer's uh, job to get a baggie and take the evidence? These little things. The reason that person may have defecated at the bench there is the city and this city has been waiting on Walmart to open its bathroom to the public instead of building standalone public restrooms downtown. Well, are you aware that there's a security guard that stands at that door? And if you're homeless or in bad shape, you're not going <laughs> into Walmart. It's not like the old Macy's where everybody just walked in. There's a security guard standing there. 
Yesterday, it was told to me that if you go toward the bathroom, security sort of checks and screens you. If you don't fit the profile, you're not going to be using those bathrooms over there. Are you aware of that? That people who are homeless can't go into restaurants, can't go into establishments to use their facilities and stuff. They don't even make it through the front door. So they're left with no option of going to right there on the street. We need to build public, dedicated, viable restrooms, not porta potties, restrooms for the public in downtown Honolulu. Passing laws against defecation, et cetera, et cetera, notwithstanding Waikiki stuff, uh, it's not a good approach on my behalf, on in my opinion. So I ask you not to just defer this, but just scrap this idea of going to persecute for something for people who don't have uh, any any choice. With that, I thank you. Members, any questions for Mr. Holly? If not, thank you very much. Is there anyone here with us who would like to testify on the prohibition of public urination and defecation bills before we go into executive session? Are we willing to yield to anybody else's okay. uh, We've concluded public testimony on the sit lie sidewalk bills, but is there anyone here who would like to testify on the public urination defecation bills? Please, ex uh, Chair Anderson and members of the committee, please excuse me for my wearing the hat. I'm having a very bad hair day. I shaved it off. Um, you know, uh, there is a, a semi-perennial candidate for high office of the higher chamber at the legislature, who has never been elected there, who's been running on the platform of the Kaka Bill and the Shishi Bill, and uh, seems to have taken a life of its own over the last couple of years. Would you like to be remembered for an issue like that? You know, there was some mention that the next council regular meeting will be held either in this venue, this area, or Kapolei Hale. You know, first I had a great deal of resistance to that until the executive secretary for the housing mentioned that there are three pockets of homeless problems. One is Waikiki, one is Kaka'ako, and the other one is the Waianae area, which is very heavily populated with Native Hawaiians, very homeless. And they can get on the bus and go to Kapolei Hale and try to see if they can outnumber the uh, city employees and see if they can help defeat these bills. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Youngquist. Members, any questions? No, Mr. Hawley? <coughs> I was just maybe I uh, mistakenly heard uh, at the beginning of testimony this morning you had mentioned that testimony would be received on all three bills. I thought it was concurrent, not consecutive. So that's why I gave con uh, some testimony on the uh, urination and defecation portion of the bill. I thought it was te one time testimony on them all, not consecutive. Thank you. I was mistaken. Thank you. Shannon, what, did you have something that you wanted to add? Okay. Okay. That said, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the members did want to go into executive session with the Corporation Council to discuss some of the bills and the bills that we will be going into executive session on. Bill 42. 
Bill 45, Bill 48, Bill 43, and Bill 46. Okay, so members, are there any objections to convening into executive session to discuss the bills that I just mentioned? Without objection, the committee convenes into a closed meetings on the bills I just mentioned, pursuant to Hawaii Revised Statute Section 92-4 and 92-5A4, to consult with its attorneys on questions and issues pertaining to the powers, duties, privileges, immunities, and or liabilities of the city, the council, and its committees on these matters. We will come back and uh, reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session. Zoning and planning. Come back to order. Okay, members. On items three and four pertaining to Bill 42, Bill 45, Bill 48. Bill 43 and Bill 46. The chair is going to recommend that we defer action on all items. In my, if all in, in in our hearing this morning, that's gone into this afternoon, it was shared with this committee by the administration that they are not ready. They clearly are not ready to roll out the affordable housing. Housing First initiative uh, that they've discussed with the council. They are also not ready to roll out their assistance to working homeless or homeless families. For those reasons, uh, members, I'm not able to recommend that we move forward on any of these measures at this time. As I did point out at the beginning of today's hearing, I remain convinced that we do need to clear our public spaces, our sidewalks, our parks, to ensure that we provide equal access to our public spaces for all people. I am likewise convinced that what we did at Thomas Square was necessary for us to see the change uh, 
in that particular area from this last year to this year today. But if we are going to take this on an island-wide approach, or even if we are going to move people out of an entire area, like in Waikiki, and if the administration has nowhere for these folks to go, and if they are not prepared to discuss with this committee their discussions with the state and what COCOA the state is going to be willing to provide, I'm not at all comfortable that we can move forward at this time. And until the administration can share with us any plans that they have, I would not be willing to put these items uh, back up for discussion by this committee. So our def the deferral today, I would say, is indefinite until we hear from the administration what their plans are going forward, as well as what their plans are to work with the state administration and the state legislature. So uh, that said, members, uh, we are open for discussion. Uh, Council Member Menor, followed yes, uh, by Vice Chair Harimoto. Yes, um, I, I need to indicate to you that I'm respectfully going to be voting uh, no. I think that there is a need for at least two of the three bills. Uh, with respect to Bill 42, uh, I think the testimony has been uh, quite persuasive that the uh, kinds of activities that are impeding uh, the use of the sidewalks by residents and especially our tourists uh, is having a negative impact on our visitor industry. In addition, the uh, administration has uh, clearly indicated, at, le at least with respect to Waikiki, that there is sufficient shelter space to, shelter space to accommodate the uh, homeless who would be impacted uh, by this bill in Waikiki. Uh, nevertheless, having said that, uh, I think that uh, Councilmember Harimoto has raised uh, a reasonable uh, proposal, a proposed uh, CD1, that would delay the effective date to January 1st, 2015. I think it's reasonable given the fact that uh, if uh, this bill passes with a delayed effective date, it will ensure that the administration will have adequate time to uh, provide sufficient shelter space for the homeless who will be impacted in Waikiki. But the visitor industry needs this bill to move forward. And so in that regard, um, uh, I believe that Bill 42 should move forward. With respect to uh, the expansion of uh, the prohibitions to other uh, communities, I think that uh, that would also be warranted, especially with respect to the commercial and business districts where uh, residents and businesses have indicated that there are certain activities that have really uh, impeded uh, the ability of customers of businesses to access those business establishments during, uh, during business hours. So as such, uh, I worked closely with the Corporation Council in putting together Bill 48, which uh, they've indicated is uh, legally defensible. However, I, I think Councilmember Harimoto has also raised a legitimate concern in regards to uh, the sufficiency of, of shelter space, uh, especially if we were to expand this island-wide. So as such, uh, I was going to propose uh, an amendment, a further amendment to uh, my proposed CD1 to also delay the effective date with respect to the proposed CD1 to, uh, for Bill uh, 48 to January 1st, 2015. So both Bill 42 and Bill 48 would move out in tandem. And it's my understanding that the uh, Corporation Council feels that both bills uh, would uh, be, be legally defensible in court, and should there be a legal challenge, that both measures would, um, would withstand a legal challenge. So I would ask that you reconsider your, your decision. Uh, I would note that uh, if we even if we move these bills out, that uh, they would still have to come up for final um, votes. Uh, bill 42 would come up for third reading, but. But Bill 48 still has a ways to go. Uh, it, it, if we pass out Bill 48, it would be passed out for second reading. It still have to come back to the committee for further consideration. But I think that these measures are important enough that they they definitely merit and warrant further discussion. And to short circuit that discussion at this point in time, I think would be premature and um, and, a, and and an unfortunate move for this committee to take. I would agree with you, uh, Councilmember Menor, that these bills are very important. And I would agree with you that the discussion needs to continue. However, even if we do delay the effective date of the bills, the administration is not prepared to tell us at this point in time when they're going to be able to implement the solutions that they're working on. First, we heard August. Then we heard an RFP would go out in August. Earliest that they'd be able to implement is October. We go ahead and pass these now. And let's say they move forward to third reading, either in August or in September or in October or whenever and the bills take effect, come the effective date, sometime in the future they're still not ready, 
and we are still sitting here waiting. All I'm asking for from the administration is for a date of certainty on their part when they feel they can move forward. Today they can't even tell us when they feel they will be able to move forward. And uh, that's the issue I'm having. And however, as I've always stated, uh, if the committee would like to uh, go ahead and vote against my recommendation and move these out today, uh, that is okay too. But I myself, as the chair of the committee, am not able to recommend that we move these bills forward, nor am I able to cast a vote in support of moving these bills forward. However, uh, the committee, every, every member of the committee is, feel, is free to vote their conscience and uh, is also free to make any motion that you'd like to make. Any further, dis uh, further discussion, Council Member Harimoto? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My opposition to these bills is very well known. And uh, the last meeting I spoke at length about my reasons for opposing these bills, so I won't repeat all that. Um, but I am in strong support of your recommendation to defer. I was fully prepared today to um, vote with reservations um, for the bill moving forward with the delayed implementation date. Um, that would partially address my concern, um, but I believe after today's discussion, um, that is even more, um, in my mind, uh, iffy, as you pointed out. Um, I heard something entirely different today than what, what I heard last month, uh, not only with the different implementation dates, but um, just in general about things that we were being told before. And, you know, it might have been my, my fault for misunderstanding, but I have a clearly different understanding today than what I did last month about what was being said. Um, I think we need to clearly determine the facts of the matter before we move forward with this. And I have asked the, implement the, the administration for an implementation date of the Housing First initiative that they can commit to. I am unable to get a date that they can commit to. And you know, rightly so, perhaps they are having difficulty um, uh, putting their finger on a date. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I agree, before we move forward, to me that's an integral part of our decision making about when this the support system will be in place. And for myself, uh, hearing what I heard today, I cannot in good conscience move forward with this until we are convinced that we have the support systems and housing in place. It would be a mistake, a tragic mistake for us to move forward with these bills. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Pine. I would like to support your recommendation. I think what it was very clear today that uh, in the testimony is one, our Waikiki industry has not been hurt by homelessness. So we can't use that as an, as an excuse to, to pass the Waikiki bill. Uh, and I think we've learned stories that we didn't think our bills would affect. And that's our local people. A society is judged by how we treat the poorest of the poor. And I think these bills would have painted us in such a different way from what I was raised and taught and how to take care of people. Certainly there, is a pe there are people in th that are homeless that drive us all crazy and they hurt it for everyone else. And I don't know how to deal with those people. But clearly many people are suffering. It used to be where Hawaii was affordable during my grandparents' days, they were building 10,000 homes a, a year. And that's why homes were affordable. But now we have the highest rate of people from outside of our state who now own Hawaii in the nation. And with having the, some of the lowest unemployment employment in the whole nation, <coughs> it's not that people aren't trying to find work. And so until we can as government leaders work with our state counterparts and our federal counterparts to use all of our resources to ensure that we build enough housing that keeps the supply in a, in a way where it's not so expensive to live here anymore. And that is what I think uh, government has failed to do in the last 30 years, is to keep up with that housing supply. But what's fantastic is that we have a great opportunity through TOD development 
things that we're already working on that I can guarantee you once those housing goes in, we're not going to see uh, the type of problems that we see on the streets. <coughs> and so I, I support um, your recommendation, Chair. I'm very proud of this council for listening to the people and actually looking at the facts of the information. And I'm, I'm sorry for many of those who are suffering because of what's going on. And I hope that we can find another solution for those situations. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Pine. Councilmember Kobayashi. Yes, I, you know, I, I do have concerns about Waikiki. I, I understand, you know, the problem there, but it would be very difficult to just do Waikiki without the other commercial areas. It would be unfair and unfair to the homeless because then where will they go? And after listening to the administration this morning, and I've always, you know, worried about their focus only on housing first. And I've stated that many times um, because we have so many homeless children, but because the priority is only on housing first, um, the administration doesn't even know the number of homeless children. And that should really be a, a priority. And after listening to all the testimony this morning, um, Chair, I, I um, will support your recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Kobayashi. Council Member Fukunaga. Thank you. I'm not a member of your committee, but I do appreciate having had the opportunity, you know, to sit in on today's discussion. I do believe that, you know, um, in terms of your recommendation at this point, I hope it forces all of us to come together very quickly because certainly I appreciate, you know, what the uh, uh, businesses in Waikiki are going through. Uh, I hear very similar things on a different scale from my uh, constituent businesses in downtown and Chinatown. So I agree that we are in the midst of a crisis. I believe we do have to work together to find appropriate solutions for each region. And I will say in you know support of the administration that uh, some of the appropriations that we have been able to include in this year's budget would assist in broadening the scope of some of the types of solutions for housing and services that can be provided in our region. So I think we really need to um, uh, push forward in urging the administration to work very closely with the council so that we can tackle this problem together and effectively come up with a solution as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Fukunaga. Okay, members. Uh, Bill 42, the chair recommends deferral. Any objections? Objection of Council Member Menor. Any reservations? Okay, noting the objection of Council Member Menor, Bill 42 has been deferred. Bill 45. Chair's recommendation is to defer. Any objections? Any reservations? Okay, hearing none, so ordered. Bill 45 has been deferred. Bill 48. The Chair's recommendation is that Bill 48 be deferred. Any objections? Noting the objection of Council Member Menor, do we have any reservations? Okay. Bill 48 has also been deferred. Chair's recommendation on Bill 43, again, is deferral. Any objections? Any reservations? Seeing none, Bill 43 has been deferred. Bill 46, Chair recommends deferral. Any objections? Any reservations? Seeing none, Bill 46 has also been deferred. Bill 42. Sorry, guys. I'm sorry, we did those. Okay. okay. The final item on our agenda this afternoon is the informational briefing from the Director of the Department of Planning and Permitting regarding the status of all pending land use ordinance amendments and development plans and sustainable community plan revision 
bills and resolutions. <coughs> uh, members, uh, Department of Planning and Permitting Director George Atta did submit a development plan updated schedule that is in your packets for review. Uh, members, do any of you have any questions or any statements in regards to the updated schedule that was circulated by the director? If not, is there anyone here with us who would like to comment on the updated plan schedule submitted by the director? Okay. If not, we've come to the end of our agenda. Uh, Vice Chair Harimoto, you are the chair of the Transportation Committee that is uh, going to be meeting next. Do you have any announcement that you'd like to make regarding your committee meeting? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing as how we've all been sitting here for over four hours, I think we all need a short break. So uh, let's convene Transportation Committee meeting in 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Council Member Harimoto. The Committee on Zoning and Planning, with no further business, is adjourned. <laughs>